we present James McKechnie in The House of the Seven Flies, the novel by Victor Kenning, adapted for radio by Kenneth Owen. The House of the Seven Flies. Well, now, Mr. Furs, I, I hope it wasn't inconvenient for you to come here this morning. Not at all. My name is Molnar, Herman Molnar. I'm Assistant Detective Inspector of Police in Rotterdam. Mr. Sloiter was a resident of Rotterdam, and in view of certain circumstances, the authorities felt we should be called in. What exactly do you mean, certain circumstances? I thought it was all quite straightforward. Sloiter died on my boat. And... Yes, we will come to that in a moment, Mr. Furs. Uh, I've read your statement to the Middleburg police, and uh, you must forgive me if I seem to go over old ground, but I do think it's necessary. Mm. One has to get things perfectly clear. Now, you are the owner, are you not, of the pilot cutter named Arletta, and your home port is Felixstowe, England? Yes. I understand you take people cruising. Uh, during the summer months, yes. I make my living that way. Now, how exactly did Mr. Sloiter come to charter your boat? He answered an advertisement in the London Times. Cruise, I think, in English waters. But Sloiter changed his mind. He came aboard the afternoon before yesterday, a day earlier than he originally intended. On the way, he suddenly asked me if I knew Holland and spoke Dutch. And you do, of course. I see you were here during the war and since. Yes. Um, please go on. His papers were in order. He didn't seem to be trying to bring anything in. He had a suitcase and a briefcase, of course, but he seemed genuine enough. And he assured me he was not wanted by the police either in England or in Holland. I took him at his word and decided to bring him across. And no questions asked? No more than I've told you. He paid me an extra 50 pounds, which doubled the fare. Mm. But um, tell me, Mr. Furs, didn't your curiosity lead you to anything else? Do you mean, did I wonder why Sloiter wanted to come back to Holland in such an odd way? Well, yes. After all, it was an odd way. He could easily have flown over. He told me he didn't like flying. And you believed him? No. His case was covered in airline labels. <laughs> But I'll tell you this, I had a vague feeling that he was suddenly anxious to leave England, but not because of the police. Ah, so. Yes, go on, Mr. Furs. Why did you think that? I don't really know. Uh, nothing definite. Just his manner. I, uh, I think he was frightened. That is what I want, Mr. Furs. The impressions, the odd feelings. My dear Molnar, I think I'd be able to cooperate more if you were frank with me. <laughs> Wait, you're very quick, Mr. Furs. I like that. What was Sloiter up to? Oh, nothing, as far as I know. He had a small marine insurance broking office in Rotterdam. And he was in England on business. Then why all the questions? Do you not expect questions from us when Sloiter dies on your boat? Surely there's no need for an interrogation. After all, it was uh, quite an ordinary death. In the morning, when I went to ask him about breakfast, he was dead. And you then decided your right course was to bring him on over? What else should I do? You did not, for instance, expect to be met when you arrived at Fera. Not at all. Why? Sloiter had said nothing about being met here. You did not know that the young lady, Constanta Strasma, would be expecting you? No. I had no idea who she was when she came alongside on the skiff. But uh, when she hailed me and uh, asked if Sloiter was aboard, I, well, I didn't know what to say. I could have knocked you down with a feather. Huh? The damn thing was, she definitely seemed to know that he was on the Arletta. And I had to tell her the news. Yes. She and Sloiter were connected in a, a business way. Mm, so she told me afterwards. You know, Mr. Furs, your impression was right. Sloiter was afraid of somebody. What are you getting at, mine hair? What is behind all this? Isaac Sloiter did not die a natural death on your boat. He was murdered. He was what? Sloiter was murdered. How? How? I swear no one came anywhere near him from the time he came aboard. You're right. No one did. But you see, he was a diabetes subject. Without insulin, he couldn't live. But taking too much also is fatal. Well? Sloiter died from an overdose of protamine zinc insulin taken at about 10 o'clock in the morning of the day he joined you. The bottles in his case should have held capsules of 10 units per cubic centigram. Now, someone had exchanged them for 100 unit capsules. Oh, yes, Sloiter was murdered. Unless he chose a particularly unpleasant and odd way of committing suicide. Well, if you meant to commit suicide, why ask me to bring him across? Death is the same, whichever side of the North Sea you would take it aboard. Exactly, Mr. Furs. Whoever planned his death knew quite a lot about medicine and about Sloiter and his habits. 
And I'm sorry, it, it's, a, it's a very sad business. And awkward for you, too, to be mixed up in it. You mean you want me to stay here? Yes. We'll bother you as little as possible, of course, but I'm afraid it is necessary. If I to remain in fair all the time, I'd like to go up to Rotterdam while I'm here. Oh, by all means, you can move about as you like. Mm. Tell me, did you go through Sloyd's luggage? I packed up the stuff he had lying around. I see. When he came aboard, you say he had just a suitcase and a briefcase? That's all I saw. You didn't open the briefcase when you were packing his other things? <laughs> what would you have done, mine here? I packed his suitcase and had a good look through it. Oh. Uh, then you found the insulin? Yes. And the briefcase, you looked in that? Frankly, if I'd been able to find the key to it, I'd have opened that as well, but I couldn't find the key. Thank you for being so honest, Mr. Furs. You know, I had a little wager with myself that you would admit to your curiosity. <laughs> I should have done the same thing in your place. Mm. By the way, where was the key? On a thong round Slaughter's neck. Ah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> Tell me, this girl called Stratzma, she said Sloiter had sent her a wire to meet him. You know all about her, I suppose? Certainly, Mr. Furs, we know all about her. She's the proprietor of the Stratzma Sleepdienst Company. That's a small tugboat concern. And Sloyter was making inquiries for her in England about spare marine engine parts. She can't help about his death? No, I'm afraid not. No, I just wondered. Yes, of course. Well, I don't think we need to detain you any longer, Mr. Furs. If we want you again, we'll contact you. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, you've been very helpful. Not at all. Uh, good day, Manher. Good day, Mr. Furs. Hans, send me you Frau Stratzma into me. I'd like to see her again. Oh, and uh, put two men on, Mr. Furs. I want to know everywhere he goes, everything he does, and everyone he sees. Come in. Ah, uh, please come and sit down, you Frau. Thank you, mein Herr. You have seen Mr. Furs? Yes, but I'm afraid he couldn't help as much. Are you sure you never heard Sloyter mention him? Quite certain. And you'd never heard of him before? Never. Sloyter sent me a telegram saying he was arriving at Vera aboard the Arletta. That was all. I went there to meet him. Yes, you know, it's strange. The telegram was sent before Sloyter went aboard the Arletta in England. Now, supposing Furs had refused... Would it really have mattered? He would have sent a further telegram. Perhaps. Still puzzles me. You're quite sure that in these papers of Sloiter's, these, these from the briefcase, I mean, there is nothing which he didn't have or know when he left for England? Quite sure. There's nothing fresh. And yet you're convinced that Sloiter had found out something in England. Now, why? I knew Sloiter. The fact that he sent me a telegram to meet him meant that he was excited and had something to tell me. I'm sure that his visit had been successful. The fact that he was murdered points to that as well. Well, maybe you think he was murdered for something which was in that briefcase. But no one except Mr. Furs and yourself had an opportunity of opening the case before the police. You know, it was never intended he should die on the Arletta. It sounds very complicated. As far as you're aware, did anyone else know that you and Sloyter were after the Neuwell Halanza diamonds? I never discussed it with anyone. Ah, Sloyter might have done. Mm. It was rather an odd arrangement between you, wasn't it? I don't think so. Oh? During the two years after the war, I was a secretary in his office at the Allied Agency, and we both knew about the Neue Hollandse Bank affair. Sloiter worked on it, trying to discover what had happened to the bank's diamonds, but he never got anywhere, not any further than the essential facts. Which were that the Germans raided the bank one night, shot the night watchman, and took away the ten security boxes containing the diamonds. When I took over my father's business in Dortrecht, I came across a bundle of old German naval signal messages. That put me on to Capitan Walter Masoli. Mm. I told Sloiter about it, and we decided to go into the thing together for the sake of the reward offered by the bank for information leading to the recovery of the diamonds. I put up a certain amount of money for Sloiter, and he did the work. And you think now that Sloiter had located the diamonds? I'm sure of it. What do you think of this Englishman? Hmm? Well, do you think he knows anything? Could he, perhaps, have murdered Sloiter? We must always contemplate the possibility. But I don't think so. What was your impression of him? Mm. I found him pleasant, rather attractive. Oh? I don't think he has anything to do with this. He doesn't look like that. Mm, they never do. 
However, when you're on the river, I believe you are quite a lot, you may run into him. I shouldn't try to avoid him. If he talks to you, just let him talk, but don't tell him anything. He said that he tried to have a look inside Sloyd's briefcase and couldn't find the key. He tried to do that? Wouldn't you? <laughs> no, he appears to have acted naturally enough. But if he isn't speaking the truth, then he may make a slip and reveal something he's not supposed to know. He may have opened that briefcase. The key wasn't really hidden. What do I do then? All I want you to do, Miss Stratzma, is to keep your own counsel and look after yourself. Whoever murders Sloyter will obviously have quite an interest in you. Does that worry you? No, mein Herr. In my business, you have to be able to look after yourself. Huh. Perhaps Mr. Furs and I will be travelling back to Verde on the same bus. I'll try to get to know him better. You can try. I don't think he intends to stay in Verde very long. He intends going up to Rotterdam. Now, I wonder who he knows up there. Major Fells, Major Fells, come in, sir, come in. Hello, Charlie. <laughs> well, this is a pleasure, long time no see, eh? <laughs> well, are you surprised to see me? No. No, I know you were here the moment you spit on the stones at Fairda. Private information, private wire, expensive but necessary in my business. <laughs> if I don't know things before the police, Charlie here is liable to land in jail and lose a lot of good money. Well, one of these days it's bound to come. Oh, well, we shall see. Now, you tell me, what brings you up to Rotterdam, eh? What is it? You've got a safe hiding place. Listen, whatever it is, you leave it to me. I want this envelope put where no one can get at it. I guard it with my life. Uh... You think much more, or not at all, about that proposition I make the last time? No, I thought about it, but for the moment, that's all. Uh, that's what I guess. You come in here with a dead corpse, we know that, eh? All right, now you tell me more, I go to work. Anything for you, sir, no? Your instincts are sound, Charlie, but you're going too fast. I just want you to look after that envelope for me, and later I hope I'll do a lot of explaining, and I may want your help. Uh -huh. What's the percentage? Oh, it might run as high as 50. 50? Yeah. You say that to other men, you're in trouble. But with me, I won't hold you to your generosity. <laughs> the uh, envelope, I see, is sealed. Now, when a thing like that is shut up, I don't guarantee my curiosity won't get too strong. You can open it now. It won't mean a thing to you. In that case, I'll leave it sealed up. You sure you don't want help now? I'll let you know when I do. Now, put that envelope away for me. Okay, okay. I'll do that. Right. You know, I've got a safe in here even I can't find sometimes. Tell me, Charlie, do you know a man called Anselm Decker? Who's that? Anselm Decker. Nice little chap who swims quite well and can't keep his hands off other people's property. Decker? You had trouble with Mr. Decker? Oh, nothing spectacular. Well, how do you mean by that? I got back to Vera from seeing Molnar in Middleburg yesterday, and Decker was searching my boat. After money, he said, to keep his wife and kids. He ain't got no wife and kids. I dropped him overboard into the river. Tell me, who does he work for? Himself. Doesn't every man. But listen, you pay him a hundred guilders, he works for anyone. I don't know who it will be right now. He must be in a very friendly mood to tell you his real name. Friendly and very sure of himself. Oh. I expect to see him again. Ah, and so you come to see Charlie and get Charlie to put the envelope in a good, safe place, right? Could be. What do you think of Molnar? Uh, Assistant Detective Inspector Molnar. Yes. You keep away from him what he don't know, which is a lot he's very good at guessing. Also, he's patient, like a monument. And a girl called Constanza Stratzma. Do you know her? Now you're in trouble with a woman? No, I don't know anyone, Stratzma. No, it's the lot, then. Ah, Major Furser, that's not the lot. You don't ask me anything about the man called Sloiter who was dead on your boat. Why should I, Charlie? I know you knew him. You gave him a reference to me in England. You told him to contact me if he wanted to get away quietly. That is not the story I gave to Molnar, of course, but I know you can't tell me anything about him which would help. Listen, in this head of mine, there's a lot of stuff I don't put on the counter, Major. You try me. Why did Sloiter go to England? Oh, you tell me. You see? You can't help me. If you'd known, you'd have known about Constanza Stratzma. You make me very curious, Major. Do you handle jewelry? Jewelry? Well, uh, you got to have the answer to that? Not if you don't want to tell me. All I want to know is, could you 
if. Uh, well, maybe I do it once or twice, but uh, it's not my line. Uh, maybe, though, I do it sometimes. Where? Antwerp? Ant Ant Antwerp? Oh, <laughs> oh, my jeepers. No, anybody want trouble, let them try Antwerp with that kind of stuff. You should know where I unload the last lot, I think. England? What the hell do you mean? Uh, uh, don't, please, go getting angry now, sir. No, no. I know I just told you it was some stuff. Uh, I don't say it was all watches, but, uh, well, if you like to believe that, okay, sir. It, uh, well, it was pretty for us both. Which trip was this, you damned old rogue? The first one you ever did for me with the watches. Hmm? <laughs> you ought to let people settle for themselves what risks they'll take. I don't think the customs people are too happy about me back home. Oh, maybe not. But the first time a man does our kind of work, he says he begin with a little risk. Just to work into it, but no, sir, he's wrong. First time, take a big risk. That's when it's safest. That's yes, your idea. It's not mine. Oh. Now, who in heaven is that? Good evening, Charlie. I believe Mr. Furs is with you. Who the devil's that, Charlie? It's a friend of yours out of the river, Mr. Furs. Decker. Tell him to go jump back in. I'd like a word with you, Mr. Furs, if I could come in. It isn't my home, Decker. Charlie won't mind, will you, Charlie? I speak, but come in. Well, how's the family? Family? Hmm. Oh, yes, fine. My wife, she's very annoyed with you, Mr. Furs. My suit shrunk. You told her why it got wet? She wasn't interested. It'll do for one of the boys, won't it? Now, what do you want? The boss would like to meet you, Mr. Furs. You mean it wasn't money you were looking for yesterday? Not yesterday. The boss wants to see you. He's very persistent. You will only have to pay more money to have someone else persuade you. They wouldn't be as polite as I am. I believe in politeness up to a point. I'm glad to hear it, Decker. I'll forget what you called me when I dropped you into the river yesterday. Oh, the shock, Mr. Furs. For a moment, I forgot myself. What does the boss want with me? I really wouldn't know. Did you know what you were looking for on my boat? I think you know yourself what it was. I have a good idea. Where do I meet this boss of yours? Here. I expect him any moment. Well, of all the chief... What's his name? Ninas Rona. Rona? You had nothing to do with Rona, Major Furs. Nothing, nothing at all. I don't think there's a great deal of choice in the long run. Perhaps you'd better get rid of your friend, Mr. Furs? I'm sorry, it's his house. Who is it? Rona. Ah, excuse me a moment, gentlemen. It's the Furs, I presume. I am. What do you wish to see me about? Hey, you know you are more or less alone in Rotterdam. I thought you might welcome a little company. I like to choose my own company. Why don't you come to the point, mein Herr Rona? Ah, yes, the point. I rather think you know what it is, Mr. Furs. There was once a man by the name of Isaac Sloiter. Oh, by the way, what do you think of mein Herr Molnar? He doesn't dress as well as you, but I'd rather do business with him. If you'd any intention of doing business with Molnar, you would already have done it. You haven't, and you never will. That puts us in the same class. You seem well informed. I am. Slighter's belongings were handed over to the police, but not all of them. You kept back certain things, Mr. Furs, certain papers. In an envelope, perhaps. From the briefcase. Go on. You interest me. I don't blame you for keeping them back. I'm only annoyed that the opportunity came to you instead of me. Pity he came to me a day earlier than he originally intended. He should have died in England. Possibly. However, this thing is too big for one man to handle. You must have realized that. Eventually, you will need help. Now, I'm offering to help you, Mr. Furs, or to make it simpler for you, to buy out your interest in this affair. Well... I'm not looking for a partner, my Herr Rona. You're wasting your time. The answer is a very definite no. You're stubborn. You think you will have all those diamonds to yourself. But let me tell you, Mr. Furs, a quarter of a million pounds is a lot of diamonds. I intend to have them myself one day. That remains to be seen. I think you'd better go. I dislike the English, Mr. Furs. At the moment, I'll... Concede that you are in a strong position. You think you can handle it. That won't last long. I shall see that you change your mind, Mr. Furs. Come, Decker. You go 
with a bad enemy there, Major. He means what he says. What do you know about him, Charlie? Oh, not at all a good man. I don't give tuppence for him. Half Dutch, half French. He's not particularly honest. Honest? Oh, right enough. You want me to laugh in your face, but his wife. Well, how about his wife? Oh, well, she, she worked in a military hospital during the war as a nurse. And she is twice as ruthless as Rona. Hmm. Interesting people. Now you listen, sir. Why don't you tell me? What's all this business about a, a quarter of a million in diamonds? Charlie, do you know any place around the Haring Fleet called the Seven Flies? Seven Flies? Mm -hmm. What kind of place? I don't know. Around the Haring Fleet, you say? Well, there's a restaurant in Amsterdam called the Five Flies. Very famous, that one. I want the Seven Flies. Mm -hmm. Well... No, Major, first, I don't know it. Now, oh, come on, why don't you tell Charlie what this is all about? You come across with a dead sloiter, you give me an envelope to look after, then you get a visit from Rona, who talks of diamonds, lots of diamonds, and now you ask me riddles about flies? All very interesting, if I knew exactly what it was all about. Charlie, do you know anything about the Neuer Hollandser Bank affair? Hmm? Oh. oh, I get it. A quarter of a million in diamonds, but nobody know where they go. They just vanish. That was on the night of November the 2nd, 1944. And you're right, of course, from the moment the raiders left the bank, no trace of them has ever been found, rather had ever been found. You mean you know where those diamonds are? Not quite. Just recently, Sloiter, with the aid of Constanza Stratzma, got onto them. They traced a certain Capitan Walter Masseling, who was in charge of the bank raid, and got the diamonds away by boat. He was machine-gunned by Dutchmen somewhere in the stretch of water of the Maas, the Haring Fleet, and the boat went down with the diamonds aboard. Uh, but you don't know where? No. Sloiter did. He found out in England, and he left a clue. And the clue is in that envelope I gave you. You mean not even the police know all this? Neither the police nor anyone else. And you have got the clue to a quarter of a million... Oh, your life, it ain't worth a damn thing. In that envelope was an unmarked British Admiralty chart, number 192 of the River Mars and East Skelt, Haring Fleet Browse Hafen and Romport to Hollandsch Deep. Uh, why you say was? I destroyed it, Charlie, along with one or two other important papers that gave the whole story of Sloiter's investigations. Without those, the whole thing was pointless, should anyone open that envelope. But what is the clue you have left in there? By itself, without that chart, it's meaningless. But I have another chart in my boat among my own papers... What is in that envelope is a six-inch square of blue tracing paper. That's all. That's all? But... On it, there are three crosses irregularly spaced, and under the center cross is written the words, Seven Fliechen. Seven flies. Exactly. And a little to the left of this cross is a dotted circle the size of a small nail head. Now, all one has to do is to find some landmark near the Haring Fleet known as Seven Flies, and then fix it on the chart 192. Uh -huh. The overlay will do the rest. Uh -huh. Now, whoever drew up the crosses didn't see fit to name the other two, only the one for the seven flies, so we can assume that they stand for landmarks, mm. churches or boys already marked mm. on the chart. Mm. Now then, orient the overlay, and the little dotted circle will tell us where a quarter of a million lies. Okay. So, all we have to do is find the seven flies. Yes, yeah, if we can. Mm. And uh, it was for this information that Sloiter was killed and Mynheer Rona came to make his pleasant offer? Right. Mynheer Rona is convinced that I have this information somewhere. Someone gave Sloiter an overdose of insulin by switching his capsules. He should have died in his hotel in England, but he came to me a day early. Oh, and so you got the envelope instead, instead of... Instead of whichever friend of Rona was in England to collect it. Someone who knew all about Sloiter and insulin and medicine. Elsa. Rona's wife. She used to be a nurse, didn't I tell you? Could be. Uh -huh. And uh, you say that the police know nothing of this? I told them I couldn't find the key to Sloiter's briefcase. Of course I did, and all the information inside. I still don't know exactly where this Stratzma woman fits into the picture at the moment. You met her since you landed? Well, she was interviewed by Molnar, and she came on the bus with me to Fera for Middleburg. She didn't say a thing, not about Sloiter. I got the feeling she was waiting for me to talk. Aye. You think she thinks you know? I don't really know, Charlie. She may have followed me up to Dintelsas, or it may be just that she may have had to come that way. She didn't come all the way to Rotterdam? I don't think so. Aye. And what do we do now? You will do nothing yet. First, I have to find this place of the seven flies, and after that, 
I shall need your help. We don't want Meinherr Rona picking up a trail anywhere. So long as he doesn't know where the envelope is or what I'm after, so well and good. He'll have you watched. I don't doubt that. Molnar's probably doing the same thing. Are you going back to Dintel's house in the morning? Yes. I may call you from there or somewhere that way. This seven flies are somewhere in the Haringfleet area. Now, what's needed is a plan of campaign. <laughs> that sounds more like the major furs of the war. I can run down the Feilachat about halfway along Tienchemitten Island and go over to Neuvendijk. Okay. I should expect to hear from you, but you watch out for mine here, Rona. He'll shoot his own grandmother. I'm not his grandmother. He doesn't gain anything until he knows where the diamonds are, if he ever knows. Frau. Yes, my herr. Do you know any place around here called Safe and Fliegen? No place called that round Nine Dyke, my herr. Thanks. It's nothing. Ah, oh, damn. Oh, it is nothing. You coming ashore? Not today, mein Herr. Can you tell me, is there some place near here known as the Seven Flies? Seven Flies? Yes. Oh, not that I've heard in my lifetime. And I've lived in Stadshoek all of 53 years now. No, mein Herr. No Seven Flies around here. Thank you all the same. Good day. Good day, my Herr. I wonder, can you tell me, is there anywhere near Middelharnis called Safe and Fliegen? There's a restaurant in Amsterdam called the Five Flies. Yes, yeah, so I believe. Uh, I've never heard of a Seven Flies in the Harding Fleet. No, never. Uh, is it a house or a restaurant? I don't know. To me, it's just a name. It might even be a sandbank or a clump of trees. Oh, I wish I could help you. Five Flies, yes, but another two. No, not at all. Oh, Fliegen, you know, is a Dutch name. That's how the restaurant in Amsterdam is called. Not after flies at all, but after the name of the family who started it in the 16th or 17th century. Maybe you should inquire for a family called Flichen. Thank you. That's an idea. Have you tried over at Hellefoot's Lace? Not yet. Or maybe you should. I don't know that you'll find anything, but who knows? Yes, who knows? One can but keep trying. Air, if you please. Ah, thanks. Now, will you hold her while I, I fix the boy rope? Take your time, men here. Thanks. You staying in Hillovich's lace, men here? Uh, for a while. <sighs> yeah, I've had enough for today. Anything you want? I don't think so. Thank you very much. Well, if you do, I live just over there through the white gate. Just knock. Well, I remember you. me, Mr. Furs? Decker. Are you looking for something, Decker? You might say that. You weren't long in finding me. Where's mine Herr Rona? In Rotterdam. 
And how do you come to be here? In another half hour, I was to take the ferry across to Middleharness. I wanted to examine an English yacht, Danish pilot cutter type, with one Englishman aboard. Name of the boat, Felicia. It has the same number of letters as a letter. A pretty name, too. After an aunt of mine. How long have I got before mine Herona's on my tail? As long as it takes me to telephone him and for him to get here. That shouldn't take long. If you had gone across to Middle Harness and missed me and then find I was here, he couldn't have done much until tomorrow. That's true, mein Herr. Hmm. Would you like a ride on the ferry? How much would you be prepared to pay? Ten guilders. Oh, I don't feel like the river today. My stomach... Fifteen guilders, that's the limit. I'm not a rich man. Ah, but you have hopes, eh? Possibly. Why? It is a hope all men retain until the last. I think I would like to go to Middle Harness. I could look up my sister and stay for supper. Good. Well, here, take it. Oh, thank you, my hair. How strong is your loyalty to Rona? Thirty guilders a day and a bonus when the job is done. How much bonus? It hasn't been fixed yet. Do you know what all this is about? Only what I guess, Mr. Furs. There's money in it, obviously. Enough to justify either you or Rona having killed a man called Sloiter. Would you like some advice? Why not? You should go back to England. This is a pleasant country, if you don't mind the flatness. But there's too much water. And in some places, too much loneliness. A man can disappear and never be found. In the Hollandshire Deep, for instance, you can bury something in the sands of one of the Slicken. And in a couple of tides, it is eight feet under. And in a couple of days... It has gone forever. During the war, a great many Germans disappeared like that. I'll think about it. I doubt it, my hair. I shall ride round to the ferry now. I do not hope to see you again, but I'm afraid I shall. Goodbye. Goodbye. And thank you for the advice. I didn't seem a very pleasant man. Your friend, man here, has about him the essence of evil. They say you were about right there. Tell me, is there anyone called Fliechen living in this district? Fliechen? No, no Fliechen. There's a farmer called Reichen up the Vorna Canal. Or any place or house called the Seven Flies? No, mine here. I've lived here 40 years, except for three when I was in Sumatra, and I've never met a Fliechen about here. I'm postmaster. Never a letter for a Fliechen. Or a place called Seven Flies. What are you, police? No, I'm looking for a friend. Oh, well, if he's a sailor or a merchant seaman, ask at the cafe down the road there, you see it? Uh, someone might know him, but he's no resident, nobody living Thanks, here. Thanks, I'll try. Oh, now, wait, my dear, wait. Right. <laughs> oh, I'm getting slow in my old age, I think. Fleerkin, of course I've seen a Fleerkin. See him every Sunday when I visit my wife. Well, take me to Fleerkin, I'll give you 20 guilders. Sure. <laughs> but it won't do you any good, though. Just take me to him and the money's yours. Sure, but you can't talk with a dead man, my dear, not as far as I know. He's dead? <laughs> I'm sorry, one here. He's not a friend of yours. Next to my wife, he is lying in the cemetery. Johannes Fleerken of Krabbensplatt died 1799. That's Fleerken. The only one round here. You say of Krabbensplatt? Well, that's what I said, mine here. <laughs> well, he couldn't be your friend now, could he? Here. Take the 20 guilders. Oh, 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 thank you, mine here. Now, where can <laughs> I find a telephone? Charlie, this is Furs. Oh, hello, Major. You're still alive then, eh? Look, Charlie, I'm in hell for a slice. Yes? I think I'm on to something. Listen, you ought to be careful. I heard that my dear Rona has left town. Damn Decker. You seen Decker, Major? An hour ago, he's rooked me of 15 guilders. Well, you give him money, you want your head examined. Delaying tactics against Rona. But it didn't work. Look, Charlie, do you know Krabbensplatt? Island about five miles above you, off the end of Tien Gemeten. What about it? I'm going up there first thing in the morning. After that, I'm going to Dordrecht. Can you meet me there? In Dordrecht? Oh, yes, sure I can. I'll come right through from Amsterdam by road. I'll see you about six in the evening. Everything all right with you? Yes, so far. Apart from Decker, nothing interesting. Though I did meet Miss Stratzman on the river this morning. Mm. Well, you take a tip, Major. You sleep in the hotel tonight. That boat of yours is drafty. I don't want you to catch cold what turns to rigor mortis and lock the door. I'm sleeping on the boat. I can lock the door there and have something behind it. Listen, by the way, your friend Molna had tea with me the other day. I've seen nothing of him since Middleburg. Well, you soon will, I'll bet you. Well, I'll see you in Dorecht. Goodbye now. Goodbye, Charlie. Mm. Yeah? 
Yes, Mama. What is it? I thought I caught the sound of a throat. Can you see if it's Peter come for his butter? Sure. There is someone at the jetty, but not Peter. Who is it then? Oh, that I don't know, Mama. Never saw him before. Uh, he's coming this way. Has he seen you, Jan? Yes. Oh, you see, he's beached his boat on the sand. <laughs> it's quite a while since we saw a new face on the island, Jan. Hello there. Hello there. I think that is his yacht across the river, Mama. A fine-looking boat. <laughs> yes, Jan. Good morning. Uh, I wondered if you could... Uh, uh, good morning, mein Herr. There is something we can do for you. I came over to have a look round, if that's all right. I wondered if you might have some eggs to sell. Uh, my boat is just across the river there. Oh, only duck eggs, mein Herr. We have no hens on Kabensplatt. <laughs> look around as you wish, mein Herr. I'll take the gentleman to the dairy, Mama. Uh, this way, mein Herr. Thank you. Uh, you are uh, English, I think, sir. Yes, uh, my name is Furs. And mine, Berkelman, Jan Berkelman. You own the house and the farm? Yes, it is all mine. We live alone here, Mama and I. Now, oh, you have a very nice place here, mein Herr. Everything very neat, tidy. Oh, that is not unusual in Holland. And anyway, nature is such an untidy creature that a good farmer must learn to keep her in order if he wants to live happily with her. In here, mein Herr. Uh, come here. You taste this. In the whole of Holland, you won't find milk with a better cream content. I win prizes for it. Ah. <laughs> In a moment, I show you my Frisians. You have children? One boy. My wife and I are unlucky. But my Frisians, they are my children. Each one I know. And I have a favorite, I must confess. <laughs> Oh, you mustn't do that with children, but with cows, I don't think it matters. They don't really understand. Although you would wonder sometimes with Katza. A very knowing cow is Katza. She has children in many parts of the world. Do you and your wife run the farm on your own, Miner? Oh, yes, yes. We manage without help. Uh, you'd better take what eggs you want, mein Herr. Thank you. Tell me, how did you get on during the war? It was hard. Oh, yes. In the early days, most of my cattle were taken. I saw a lifetime's work go in a moment. Nothing I could do. But later, it was better. We were left alone. War is evil from whichever side you see it. And all soldiers are men, mein Herr. In the house back there, we helped everyone who came to us in trouble. Our own partisans, British commandos, Belgians, and once or twice, even Germans who needed help. <laughs> you you think that wrong? No, I don't think I do. Oh, you were a soldier then. Yes, I was. Tell me, my Herr Beutelmann, did you ever hear of Johannes Flieken living on Krabbensplatz? Flieken? Why, of course. Old Johannes, who died in 1790-something. <laughs> but why do you ask? I came across his grave at Heliford Slice. Oh, come with me, my dear. I will show you. We are rather proud of it. Not that it is really ours to be proud of. It, it was here long before us, oh, maybe 200 years or more. Uh, go through the gate, my dear. It is the other side that matters. There. Is it not a beautiful piece of craftsmanship? You will not find gates made like that these days. I might so easily have missed it. What is that, my dear? Oh, I'm sorry, I was talking to myself. It is a beautiful piece of work, yes, but why the design of the seven flies? Oh, Fliegen, you know, east flies. Yes. Uh, when the house was built, that was in the early 18th century, it was for the family called Fliegen. There were seven of them, all brothers. The house of the seven flies. Oh, you might call it that, mein Herr. You might indeed. If you'll pardon the intrusion, I trust everything is going well, Mr. Furs. I suppose I should have expected you, mein Herr Rona. Your friend Decker wastes no time. What do you want? I want to talk business. Alone. Mein Herr Bokelman, I, I'm sorry. Oh, this, it's uh... all right, mein Herr. I am going. Perhaps we shall meet later, Mr. Furs. I shall make a point of it. Goodbye, Mr. Furs. Goodbye. <laughs> Mr. 
All right, mein Herr Rona. What do you want? A quarter of a million pounds. You're ahead of me so far, Mr. Fares, but you can't shake me off. I can wait. When you get your hands on the quarter of a million, I shall be there then, and we can discuss the matter. You're going too fast, mein Herr Rona. At this moment, I'm not even sure I won't go to the police and give them the whole story. That would put you in a bad position, wouldn't it? Can you explain, Sloiter? I had contemplated such action on your part. That's one reason why I came. Go to the police, my friend, and I will swear that you were working with me and knew all about it. It wouldn't help you a tuppenny dam. I've got your signature from the hotel you stayed at in Rotterdam. I can fix up letters from you to me. Molnar's no fool, but his weakness is always being too suspicious. He'll think we're working together. And I'll make certain he thinks it was I who put Sloiter onto you and your boat. Keep that in mind, Mr. Furs. Inform on me and you'll pull yourself in as well. Go to blazes. I don't scare that easily. Make a deal with me and I'll stick to it. You're wasting your time. Now get off the island. Think it over, Mr. Furs. I shall be around. I shan't interfere until the last moment. Then I shall come in. It's up to you what kind of a deal we make then. A friendly one or... Sorry, Charlie, to keep you waiting, but I've been out for the day. To Willemsdorp. Oh, you want me to meet you here in Dordrecht? You will have news from Krabbensplatt, so you take the day out in Willemsdorp? Huh. And with Miss Stratzma, eh? Who told you? The yacht club boatman. He saw you go off with her this morning, not to mention yesterday evening. <laughs> but that is your business. It was uh, Miss Stratzma, no? We bumped into one another on the river, but don't take me too literally. We had time on our hands, so... Uh... So, to hell with Charlie and a quarter of a million, eh? Never mind. Here, your envelope. Hmm? You know, for once I feel good. Now, damn me, you tell me why I don't ever look inside that thing. I told you what was in there. How am I to know? You don't lie to me. Maybe you trust me. I doubt it. <laughs> now then, what have you found out at Krabbenschplatt, eh? The house of the seven flies, Charlie. The seven flies marked on the blue tracing paper in this envelope. So now we can orientate the overlay. Aye. Well, you don't want visitors. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll shut the cabin door, eh? Yes, I had trouble with mine here, Rona, at Grabbensplatt. He's quite likely to burst in unexpected. Look, the bolt is down at the bottom there. Now, let's see. Now, this is chart 192. Here, give me your pencil, will you? Yes, yes. Thanks. Now, this is the position of the house of the seven flies here. Uh, uh, uh. I took a couple of cross bearings on the place. Mm -hmm. It's dead accurate. My Herr Rona watched me the whole time. What? Lord knows what he made of it. Rona? Did he come to Dordrecht? Sure. I even spotted friend Decker in Willemsdorp today. Mm. Now, look, we put the overlay on the chart mm. thus, so that the cross marked Siffenfliegen falls on the position of the house there. So? The other two crosses are fixes, you see. Uh -huh. One, the church at Middle Harness, the other, the church at Hausfahrt, on the other side of the river. <laughs> so, now we know where they are. Diamonds? Yes. Uh. Now, you see the little dotted circle there? Mm -hmm. Just there is a quarter of a million in diamonds waiting to be picked up. <laughs> and how easy will it be to get them up? Or maybe we can't get them up at all, eh? Well, from what I know of the place, they can't be lying in more than about... Two fathoms, maybe three. Inside the launch? Yes, that makes it a trifle harder. Mm. I took some soundings up there. What, and... with my near Rona around? Oh, no, no. Or at least not so much as he'd know what I was doing. But now, with the launch lying in two fathoms at low tide, I could just strip and do the job myself. Maybe if there's a lot of sand silted into the boat, we'll have to have a diving suit. Now, could you arrange that? Mm, probably. Listen, you don't need this tracing paper now. No. So burn it. To keep it will put temptation in the way of a man like Rona. Oh, these diamonds, they are uncut. Mostly? Good. Yes. That's easier then. But in placing them, we shall lose on it. Half of the quarter million. Even so, it's enough to make a kind of a, a weakness in the stomach, thinking about it. Uh, uh, maybe I, I would like another drink? Help yourself. Oh, I see you found it. Well, you trust Charlie. Are you sure that this is one thing you want to do? Don't you worry about me, Charlie. Mm, okay, okay. You go to the police right now, if you want. If you don't want, we go in and we go through with this thing. But there's one thing, one thing I don't understand. Uh, what about this Stratzma woman who comes out to meet Sloiter when you get to Fera, who you were with yesterday and today? Well? 
You don't think maybe she follow you? I don't really know. She hasn't mentioned Sloiter since that first day. She said then he was in England inquiring about some spare marine engine parts. Molnar said the same thing. It could be that... Yes, it could be that she and Molnar are hand in glove. No. But it could be that she financed Sloiter's investigations. But were they going to snatch the diamonds just the way that... Just the same way like we are? You like her, don't you? What the devil are you getting at, Charlie? No, no, all right, all right, all right. You spend a day with her. You come back aboard here with a quarter of a million practically in your pocket. But in your eyes, there's something else. I don't like to do business, not with a man who might give up all that chance of so much money for a woman. I'm not giving up that money for anybody, male or female. All right, all right, so I believe you. But why, she... I don't know. When you seeing her again? Not again. It was a day's outing and it's over, so that's that. Okay, I'd just like to know. Now, now we make a plan, eh? Um, I stay with you tonight, and tomorrow we go up and take a look at this place. Yeah? First thing, now we must find out, can you do it alone, or do we need diving gear? Second thing, we keep a good eye open for Rona. He'll watch the moment we leave here. He'll be watching us all day. Agreed. It's going to be damn difficult. Mm. If we meet on the river, we'll head over the foiler hut until he's out of sight. You can take over the wheel and Hello, I'll... Hello, uh, uh, You aboard, Mr. Fellows? Inspector Molnar, of all that's unlucky. Ah, I've forgotten Molnar. What the devil does he want? Mr. Fellows, are you there? All right, all right. Patience, Inspector, patience. Unlock the door, Charlie. Yes, all right, all right. Good evening, Mr. Furs, and... Uh, well, well. Charlie, when people like you look so happy, mine here, I don't feel so good. It's a good boat you have here, Mr. Fez. People have a habit of talking about my boat when they really have something else on their minds. Come to the point, Inspector. Right. You will leave Holland tonight, Mr. Fez. I'll do no such thing. I happen to bring a dead body into this country, and I've been told not to leave until the police give me permission. I'm giving that permission now. You will leave tonight. Not without an explanation. No? No. Then I'll tell you, Mr. Fez. I've had a report on you from the English authorities. There's ample reason to suppose that for some time you've been smuggling goods into England. Really? Mm -hmm. Smuggling? He should accuse us of smuggling? And I intend to prevent you getting into trouble in this country at least, whether for smuggling or other causes. The water tank on this boat has a false compartment. You also have on board a Luger revolver for which you hold no license either from us or the English police. So. I'm informing you officially that the Netherlands government are of the opinion that they don't want you in this country and you're requested to leave. But until you do so, you'll have two customs officers aboard and when you leave, a customs launch will escort you to the mouth of the river. All right. And what about me? Oh, you stay here, Charlie. Right? We should hate you to leave the country because we want you here against the time we shall catch up with you. You know, it seems to me that this is not the way policemen behave. Oh, Oh, there's some other reason for getting me out of the way, and I don't think it's the one you want to admit. Oh, oh don't misunderstand me, Mr. Molnar. I'll go back to England. I haven't any alternative, but I'll never believe that you're sending me off because you want to save me from smuggling. Oh, no. Why aren't you frank with me? Because you haven't been frank with me, Mr. Furs. Anyone who's frank with a policeman wants his head examining. You're still worrying about Sloiter, aren't you, mine Herr? Yes, I'm worrying about him. You think I had something to do with his death? No. If I did, I shouldn't send you back to England. But I am worrying that you know more than you've told me about Sloiter. And particularly about his mission to England. I don't intend that you should get your hands on a lot of easy money. <laughs> you see, I know what you've been doing the last few days. I know everywhere you've been and everyone you've seen, right down to a cow called Katza. You interest me. Anything else? With Rona interested in you and Decker cashing in on whatever he can get, there's only one result likely if I let you stay. And the money's not yours to have. Understand? Good. As for you, Charlie, you can get your things together and leave now. Well, I'm ready. I've got no things. Two hours, Mr. Furs. You can go ashore, do anything you like as far as stores are concerned. But I'm sure you won't mind if I insist that a customs man goes with you. I don't have any choice anyway, do I? I'm afraid not. Oh, there's a good weather report for the North Sea crossing. 
How very considerate of you to find out. Oh, what a country. Listen, why don't you send me away, too? It would be a pleasure. A man tries to keep his nose clean. Somebody accuses him of stealing handkerchiefs. That's enough, Charlie. Come on. Oh, sure, all right. Um, listen, Major Furs, mm. take the biggest risk when they least expect it. Tonight I stay in the ferry hotel here. Charlie! Well, I'm coming, so help me! Come back on the tide, Major. Bring me in the morning from Klappensplatt. You can do it, sir, with me. Right. All right, now go. Charlie, will you come or do I put you under escort? Well, all right, all right, I'm coming. Uh, goodbye, Major. Bye, Charlie. I'll be seeing you. You're damned right we can do it, Charlie. You're damned right we can. Major Fell, sir. Take the biggest risk when they least expect it. Take the biggest risk when they least expect it. What time is it, Captain? Just after 11.15, Inspector. If he's coming, he's on his way. Where are we? Off the Skelton Bank. You'll have to come around that or get stuck in the sand. Then they sneak flat to uh, lower down. You'd better cut the motor and wait. Yes, Inspector. Stop to me, children. Me dead. You'll come in without engine or navigation lights. Keep your eyes and ears wide open and not a sound. Back on the tide, Major. Bring me from Clarence Blood. You can do it, sir. With me. We can. We damn well will. See anything? You won't see a damn thing tonight. Then listen, damn it! Yes, Inspector. Must be nearly midnight. It is. Four minutes short, that's all. That's him. Where? Hey, hell, that's him! Over there! On the skid hook! He must have run the ground! A searchlight? Swing that light on the bank, man. There he is. He's got it off the bank by the look of He may have, but we've got him now, Captain. Swing right over and run in alongside. Biggest damn fool that ever walked, Fuzz. Yes? Coming back like this proves I was right about you. I simply decided I wouldn't be kicked around. You didn't come back out of defiance, you know that. You came back for a purpose. I came back. Put your own interpretation on it. My interpretation will be the same as a great many other people's when they know the facts. Is yeah, that so? All right. Catch this. Uh, hey, what the... Goodbye, my dear. Come back, you... Captain! Captain! Sure. Get your light on him! He's in the water, damn him! Put that light on him! Swing it across that way! There! There he is! Damn you, he's got his dinghy! We can't get in there, sir. Keep that light on him! What fool let that light swing? Swing that dumb light back, you idiot! Where is he now? Blast your fool, you've lost him! Get me back on that launch and I'll play hell with whoever swung that light! Get this boat of his in tow! Who is that? It is I, the Englishman. Mein Herr Beukelmann. Ah, so you've come back to us, mein Herr. But at this time of night, and your clothes, you're wet through. Yes, the boom swung over and it hit me overboard. Oh, that's a nasty cut you have. You'd better come in and let my wife dress it. Thank you, thank you, mein Herr. And do you mind if I use your telephone? I want to speak to a friend in Heliford Slice. Oh, you're welcome, mein Herr. Mama, Mama. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> my dear Molnar, he'll be so angry to have you and let you slip out of his fingers. <laughs> ah, but you made it, sir, like I knew you would. With a broken head and a ducking, yes. Uh, you stayed up at the house last night. The, the old man, he's all right, huh? Yes, of course. Well, what do we do now? You can't do anything until dead low water, Charlie. That's about one o'clock. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, a quarter of a million, eh? Just, just lying out there? We don't know for sure. Maybe, may not be. But even if we do get it up, there's Molnar. Oh, it's all right, sir, whichever way. We have luck, we get this stuff today, well, then we can slip off here tonight and be out of the country by tomorrow. And if we don't have any luck? So, then, I get you out of the country just the same. Sometime later, I come back here and, well, you trust me to do the job solus and uh, see that you come out all right. Maybe. You don't trust me, Major? You think that if you go and I do this job alone, maybe i never tell you? Well, what do you think? Hmm. Maybe. I don't trust myself to know what I would do. But that don't happen. Damn me, we have luck today, then everything's okay. We've got to have luck today, Johnny. I don't know exactly how deep she lies yet. Two fathoms, maybe more. Mm hmm. We don't know if I can manage it. Well, of course you'll manage it. Tonight, tonight we are the richest men in the whole wide... Hello. What's that? What's what? Out on the water, coming this way. It doesn't look like no one I don't know. Not in a skiff. It's a woman. Well, surely it's a woman. Coming right in. And she's seen us. Yes, it looks like she knew we were here. Don't ask me how. It's... It's Constanta Stratzma. Oh, the Miss Stratzma. I don't like that. She and Mona... I don't think so. I'll clear off, Charlie. Uh -huh. I want to speak to her alone. Oh, well, all right. How did you know we were here? Does it matter? Yes. Did you know I'd been told to leave the country? I saw you go. Then how did you know I'd come back? Here. Charlie told me about your being sent away. I met him. He also told me he was going back to Rotterdam. He didn't. I thought he was worth watching. You don't have to worry. No one knows I've come here. Not mine, Herr Rona, not Molna. How can I be sure? I can be sure. That's all that matters. How do I know that you and Molna have... Look, why have you come? I thought you might have guessed. After Willem's dog. That day is outing. Is that all it was? I've come because I love you. And I don't want you to make a fool of yourself. What do you mean? You don't have to tell me what you're doing. I know. What do you know? Everything. It was I who financed Schleuter. Hadn't it crossed your mind? It had. I know you took Schleuter's papers. There had to be papers he was bringing back. What about the police? I'm not interested in police theories. But I know Sloyd had found out something important. The location of the diamonds from Neuer Hollanzer Bank. There was nothing on him, so... Well, go on. I know what you're hoping to find out there in the river. Suppose you think I murdered Sloyter. No, you didn't do that. But you robbed him when he was dead. Maybe. So I'm a thief. What about you and Sloyter? You were going to rob the bank. That's where you go astray. We were merely going to claim the reward offered for finding the diamonds. Reward? Yes. Can't you see there's only one thing for you to do? If you ever want any peace or decent life after this, you've got to give this up and go to Molnar. Like hell. I'm in this and I'm staying in it. I don't believe you. You're not being honest. The day we went to Willemsdorp, you were honest. When you saw I loved you, you turned away from me because of this thing. I didn't understand at first, but I understand now. If you get the money, you'll spend the rest of your life turning away from people and things. Oh, don't be a fool, Alan. You know I'm right. There's nothing for you here. I want you to go. I want you to go, do you hear me? There's no place for you in my life. No place at all. If you believe that, then goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, Major, she's gone. <laughs> I thought she was going to win you oh, over. shut up. Well, it's always best... Shut up, I said, damn you. Huh? And damn the diamonds, too. But... Constanta! Wait! Constanta! <sighs> I knew it. A quarter of a million in diamonds, and he rather has the woman. Here he is. Will you be able to do anything, Alan? Ah, 
I don't know. About 12 feet of water and the current's strong. Try. It'll make things better with more now. I know. I kick the cabin door in. Then I have one more go, but I think the current will beat me. Be careful. You could easily be trapped in the cabin. I'll watch out for that. One more try and then I'll, I'll call it a day. Goodbye. It's too dangerous to play about down there now. The current, it's strong. You'll be careful. Yes, I know. The diamonds, they take second place now. You wish I hadn't come, don't you, Charlie? Mm, that's a pity. But I don't make no fuss. I was afraid of it yesterday. I see it in his eyes when he come back from Willemsdorf. I ask him then if he wants to go through with it. When he say yes, one half of me believe him, the other half, uh, it knows the truth. Does that half know that my way is the right way, too? Hmm, maybe. But I mean, a quarter of a million. How was it, Alan? Oh, no good. Might just as well pack up. Quick, Major, sir. Come aboard. Get aboard. That's Rona's launch. Yeah. Give me a, a hand. Yes, come on then. Up, 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 up. Pull him up. That's it. My gun, Charlie. Oh, no, it's in the pocket no, of my... No, no, you don't. You won't have a chance. Not against Rona. No, no, no. She's right, sir. You might just as well throw it in the... Damn, Rona. We just can't let it's him get no away. It's no use, Alan. I'm coming, Mr. Pearls. Just as I said. Go to hell. I always told you I would come in when the moment was right, remember? But this time there's no partnership. Your hands a little above your heads, I think. That's right. I've told Decker not to take any risks. How the devil did you find us? I have a better information service than the police. Get dressed. Charlie, throw the painter aboard. We'll tow you in. You can leave the morning boy where it is. I presume it marks the position of Captain Marzening's launch. What did you find down there, Mr. Furs? A lot of sand and water. Uh, we'll talk about that later. Decker? Yes? When we get ashore, take Charlie and the girl up to the house and lock them in. There's an old fellow called Boykelman and his wife up there. Keep them in as well. All right, my man. My Herr Furs? Yes, Jan. What does all this mean? All these people that invade our house, the man who came before... I'm sorry about it. I'll explain later. But for the time being, you must do what these people tell you. But they tell me I cannot go out of my house. That's mine Herr Rona's instructions. But what about my herd? It is almost milking time. If they're not milked, it will be very bad for Rona's them. Rona's coming up. I'll speak to him then. His orders at the moment are that we all stay here. He's put Decker outside in the yard. He's down below the window. A nice-looking rat. Uh, and here comes another one, King Rona. Got that, Charlie? Nothing that you would appreciate. Well, Mr. Furs, I'm right, am I not, in supposing it was the launch you were after in the river? Anything you want to know, you can find out for yourself. Oh, no, you're going to tell me all you know. Otherwise, well, it would be a silly thing to make me do. It would be badly beaten up. It's more sensible for you to talk. Ah, got to blazes. There's no point in being stubborn. All right, I'll tell you. The launch is down there. She's lying over on one side. But without a diving suit, you can't work on it except just around dead low water. The current is too strong otherwise. Did you get into the cabin? No, I managed to kick the door in, but that was as far as I got before the current became too much for me. You'll never get away with this, mine Herr Rona. The moment you leave this place, I'm going straight to Molnar. It means trouble for me, but a lot more for you. Don't worry about me. I can be out of this country in a few hours. That's all I need. Decker, well, he'll have to swim. He swims quite well, I believe. If we find we can't do it, we'll send over for a diving outfit and have it here by midnight tomorrow. Now, stay quietly in the house here, all of you, and you won't come to any harm. If you try anything funny, there won't be any half measures. There's too much money in this for me to take any chances. But what about my herd? Your herd, Boykelman. Damn your herd. But it's almost milking time. And if they're not milk... Surely you can let him milk his cows. He thinks the world of his Frisians. Sentiment. Have him wandering all over the damned island. Think again, Furs. They're only in the pasture at the side of the house. Decker can drive them into the yard and he can milk them there. Decker? Milk cows? Damn it, Rona. You're taking over his house. It's the least you can do. All right, Furs. When Decker has driven the cows in, Boykelman can come out. But the rest of you keep to the house. 
Hail till tomorrow, and if you're wise, you won't try to get out. If you do, you'll be here for eternity. Six feet under. Well, it always happens, sir. Listen, maybe we could still make a deal with him? No, Charlie. Well, seems a pity he should get away with all those dark... I said no, Charlie. Oh, okay, sir, okay. You know best. I... Maybe, uh... I'll take a look around, yes? You might find a way out. Thank you, sir. About the cows. That's all right, mine here. What's Decker doing, Constanta? He's going to the pasture. My wife and I... Will you excuse us? Yes. My wife, she will see about some food, and I have the cows. A cut, sir, will wonder where I am. Who's cut, sir? Cut, sir, is his favorite cow. A very knowing cow who has children in many parts of the world. He's very attached to his cows. The Boykelmans have been unlucky. They have no children. The cows take the place of the children. Decker's bringing them in now. Ah, good. This morning, I thought I was never going to see you again. You sent me away. I know. I, I was very unkind. Oh, it was just a mood at the moment. You do mean it still, don't you? No matter what I am, what I meant to do, it makes no difference. None. <laughs> You're crazy. All you get is me. There won't be any reward money from the bank. Damn, mine here, Rona. How did he find us? Oh, Rona hasn't succeeded yet. The police may find us too. Maybe we can do something. I don't see what we can do. All the windows are barred on the ground floor as though it were a prison. It is a prison unless we feel like jumping from the window and risk being shot. Yes, I wrote mine here, Rona, off too easily. Well, it feels better when you've got something inside of you, but not a great deal. <clears throat> What are we going to do about mine here, Rona, sir? What can I do? You know, I've got a feeling that you don't want to do anything about mine here, Rona. Major, there's something here I don't understand. Mm. It, it, it's not good to have mysteries between friends. Not good at all. There's no mystery, Charlie. The Boykumans want to know what it's all about. I think we should tell them. Or rather, you should tell them, Alan. And you needn't go into unnecessary details. Speaking of my reputation, huh? Why not? It belongs to me as well now. Mm. Mein Herr Beuckelmann. Uh, yes, mein Herr. You want to know what all this is about? Well, my wife and I, we would like to have it explained. Have you heard of Captain Walter Marceling? Uh, yes, mein Herr, I have. He was in this house during the war. Oh, yes, mein Herr. I've told you before that we gave shelter to anyone who came. A sick man has no nationality. But I don't understand what these people have to do with the German captain. You will, mein Herr, you will. You see, Marceling led the raid on the Neuer Hollitzer Bank in which a night watchman was shot, and a quarter of a million pounds worth of diamonds was stolen. He brought the stones away in a launch. Marceling was injured by one of your own partisans and managed to get ashore to you. Till recently, no one knew what had happened to them, and the bank offered a reward for their recovery. Those diamonds were sunk along with the launch just off the islands here. I've come here with Miss Stratzma to recover the bank's property. But unfortunately, our friend, mine Herr Rona, outside had become aware of our intentions. He is going to take it for himself. And once mine Herr Rona gets his hands on the stuff, he'll be away so clean, just like a whistle, eh? No, the real trouble is that mine Herr Rona isn't going to get his hands on the jewels. Hmm? The diamonds are no longer in the sunken launch. There's nothing in that launch cabin but an empty steel deed box. When I went down the last time, I got in easily. There was the box. The lid was open, and it was empty. Someone got there before us. And when my Herr Rona out there finds nothing, he'll think we've double-crossed him, and that is the moment when he's going to be very unpleasant indeed, and the moment we've got to avoid. Oh, well, for me, sir, I'll wait until the trouble comes. Blood you can't get from a stone, and Rona can't get out of us what we haven't got, though he might draw a little blood. What I want to know is, where is all this stuff now? Who was it that got here before us? I am the one who has taken them. And it was done the day after Captain Muzzling entered this house. What? You took them, Beutelmann? Yes, my dear. Or rather, I stole them. Jan! Oh, it's the truth, my dear. You know it. And now it's better to tell it and have the thing from my mind. Well, where are they? Oh, I don't, I don't, these shocks, damn me, I, I don't accommodate them so good. 
Let him tell it in his own way. This captain I found early one morning at the courtyard gate. He was wounded and ill. In this house, he was in bed for three days before he left us. The first day, he was delirious and kept talking about these diamonds. It was not difficult to find the launch. I found the box in the cabin and the jewels. I took them. When the tide rose, I towed the launch off into deep water where she would always be covered even at low tide. After three days, when the captain was still not really well enough to travel, he took my skiff and went over to the mainland. He didn't say one word to me about the diamonds, and so I knew that they didn't belong to him. But did you know where the diamonds came from? No, 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 no. No, when you steal something, it is easier not to know anything about the owner. At least, that is what I felt. Why? Why did you do it? Because of my cows. A week before this captain came, the Germans had been to the island and had taken away all my herd except Katza. They took away 15 years of my life. When I saw the diamonds, I said to myself that I would keep them and after the war use them to buy a new herd. But when the time came, I... I couldn't do it. Mama and I decided that it was better to work, to use our own money, and to start again. But what happened to the diamonds? Oh, we hid them, and they have remained hidden ever since. We were afraid for our reputation to hand them over to the police and tell the full story, but I'm glad now that I can tell it. It was I who persuaded Jan to do this. Only I knew what the loss of his cows meant to him. After the war, I'd still have used the diamonds, but Jan wouldn't let me. I understand why you did it. I think you would all have done the same. You're very kind, my Jufra. Oh, and me, I think like Miss Constanta, but uh, <laughs> all that's uh, past and finished. You um, still have the jewels on the island? Yes, they are well hidden. They've been lying these many years in the... No. No, Jan. Don't tell us anything. You've still got my Herr Rona to deal with, and the fewer people who know where they are, the safer it is for us. But one doesn't know not even hard knocks can get out. Oh, yes, Major, yes, maybe that's right, yes. Uh, when we have dealt with Manhir Rona, uh, then is the time to worry about the stone. Yes, but how are we going to deal with him? Ah, uh, at the moment, I don't know. The weather looks as though it's breaking. If there's rain tonight, it might stop them diving for the diamonds. That'll give us a little more time. Oh, well, when you can do nothing, it's a good thing to sleep. I shall go to bed. Good night. Good night. Good night, good night Charlie. Charlie. Mynheer Beutelmann. Oh, Mr. Furs, you're up early. I was just lighting the fire. It is not a nice morning. Oh, see, it's raining and, and the mist is coming down. You've seen Charlie. He's not in his room. Then I don't know where he can be. You have not seen him, my dear? No, not this morning. Alan, they're coming up from the river. <laughs> Rona, Decker, and Charlie. Charlie. Dad. So that's it. That's how Mynheer Rona knew we were here. When Constanta and I were on the beach, he came and telephoned. Oh, what a fool I am. They're bringing the cows in with them. They're bringing the cows for milking. I can't think why they should be bothering to do that. Open the window. Well, Charlie. Major, are you angry with me? You're a dirty, double-crossing little swine. Oh, certainly, Major, certainly. It is unfortunately true. But what is a man to do against his own nature? First, I think of you and the lovely miss. And I say, they are both these people my friends. And then I think of all those lovely diamonds and I say, a man's best friend is himself. But unfortunately, last night, you stopped my near Boykerman from saying where the diamonds are. We should like to know that now. Yes, I bet you would. You'd better advise them to speak up, Fez. You can do this thing pleasantly or unpleasantly. It's up to you. Come away from the window. He may shoot. No, he wouldn't dare. Well, Boykerman, are you going to talk? I shall tell you nothing. You will, and quickly. Why do you think we brought the damn cows in? Out of kindness, so you can milk them? Huh? Think again, Menhair. I'll give you a count of six to begin to tell me where the stones are. If you don't, I'll put a bullet through the cow's head. After that, I'll shoot the rest, one by one, until you decide to speak. Oh, I... 
Bring that animal over here, Decker. All right, Boykelman. One. You must tell them. We can't let them do this to you. These diamonds are not mine, and I cannot give them away. So? Oh, this is my punishment for the one act which has been a shame to me for so many years. Hey. You must tell them, Boykelman. Tell them. No, John, no. You must speak. No, Mama, I cannot. Oh. But, John, you... No, no, Mama. Tell them, Boykelman. You can't let them kill your herd. They are my children, but I cannot dodge my punishment. Why? I wish I'd let you tell us last night. Oh, it is better that I did not, my hair. I, I'm not afraid. You cannot let them do it, Jan. <laughs> oh. Tell them, Jan. All right, Boykelman, that's number one. Give you a chance. Decker's fetching a number. It's Katza. My beautiful Katza. You have five seconds, Michael Mann. One, two, three, four, five. Don't do it! I'll tell you where they are. And may God punish you. Well, it's time somebody up there showed some sense. Where are they? No, Mama, no, Mama. Believe me, John. They are buried under a flat stone in the dairy. I'm mm. sorry, but I had to do it. I couldn't oh. let them... I'm glad you did it. You had to. I'm glad. Send the old fool down to show us. The rest of you stay out there until I let him out into the yard. You'd better go, mine hair. Yes, I, I'd better go. I'm to blame for this. Not Jan. He's good. He's always been good. When he found the diamonds, I made him keep them. I said they were ours by right. But in his heart, he could never accept that. And after we'd built up the herd by our own efforts, he tried again to persuade me to hand them over, but I wouldn't let him. Please, let me take you downstairs. Well, no, no, I must watch and see they don't hurt Jan. They won't hurt him, don't you worry about that. But we've got to do something to stop them getting away. They're all armed. I'll take a risk on that. If only we could get out. With a guard at the back door and Decker leaning up against the dairy at the front. There is a way out of this house, Van Herr. Another way. Aunt will show us, but quickly, there's little time. From the little harbour, at the head of the cut where the boats are, there's a large drain that runs right under the house. Yes? You can get into it through a trap door in the cellar, and where it comes out, under the courtyard wall, there's an iron grill which I think can be lifted off. Ah, right. Let's see what we can do. Are you ready, Constanta? Ah. All right, Constanta. Yes. I'm all right. Keep your head down. You must be almost there. Shall we be able to move the grill? We'll see when we find it. It's getting lighter, isn't it? Oh, there's a slight bend. It must be just around the corner. It is. Look, it is. Oh, I don't know whether we stand a chance or not. Ah, it's choked with seaweed and drift. Tide must flow up into the drain at high water. Will it open? I think so. It's only dropped into place over the staples in the brickwork. You'll have to give me a hand to lift it, I'm afraid. All right. All right. You take that side. You ready? Yeah. Right home. Then Ooh. up. Oh. It isn't moving. It won't move. But it must. It must. Come on. Try again. This time. Ready? Up. <sighs> oh. Now, let it down on the floor. Uh, careful, mind your toes. Now, listen, there's a guard at the back of the house, but he won't bother us, at least at first. Decker's the man we want. He's in front, and I'm going after him. You keep close behind me. Now, come on, hug the courtyard wall until we get to the gate. So far, so good. See, there's Decker. Look, across the yard, through the mist. What do we do now? I'm going over the top of the wall further round. I work around the dairy wall and then jump Decker at the corner. Do be careful. He's got a gun. I'll be all right. When we've dealt with Decker, we'll see what's happening in the dairy. Now, oh. enough with it, Charlie. Workman, oh. give him a hand with that slab. Oh, precious heaven, there it is, my dear Rona. Look at it. It will do you no good. It will do a lot of good. Come on the lid and let me see. The diamonds are there, my Herr Roma. All of them. Open the lid. <laughs> ah. See them, Charlie? See them? <laughs> a quarter of a million. Beautiful. 
All right, both of you. <laughs> Take your last look. What the hell are you? Furs, Stay just they... where you are, Rona. And you, Charlie. But I'll blow a hole in them. Damn you, Furs. I'll see you in hell before I... I... doubt it. Would even think about using that gun. My fingers itch. Boitelman, take it from him. And the one in his pocket. Alan. Constanta, take the diamonds and get hold of the police. We'll look after these gentlemen until they come. I'm sure you'll be all right. Yes. Do as I say and do it quickly before Decker comes round. Right. And watch out for the guard at the back of the house. Major, sir, you got this all wrong. I was only oh, trying no, to... Oh, no, Charlie, not me. I haven't got anything wrong about you. No, not this time. Oh. Boitelman. You got the key to the dairy? It's in the house. All right, go and get it. Yeah. Rona, give him the house key. Good. Take it, Jan. Yeah. Now, try not to make too much noise. We've taken care of Decker, but we don't want to disturb the other fella. Not until we've got these safely locked up in here. I, I will be quick. Good. Now then, you two. Sit down. Oh, thank you, Major. Well, uh, how many years do you think I shall get? Ooh, two or three. Oh, you want to bet? No. You'll get all that's coming to you. You know, you're a fool first to go soft on that girl. You've got the stuff now. Think of it. A fortune for each of us. No trouble about cashing it and no trouble about getting out of the country. Let me go. You don't have to be vindictive. Handing us over to the police means nothing to you. Uh, mein Herr Rana, maybe you should cry a little bit. <laughs> it helps with some men, you know. Uh, you're wasting your time. I know this man. I'm his best friend, and even for me, he will do nothing. I don't expect nothing, so I don't disappoint myself. Oh, it, it's harder for you, of course. Uh, you think you have to answer for Sloiter, but, well, that's the risk you took when you killed him. <laughs> for me, I, I don't never take that kind of risk. Prison? Yes. I've seen the inside before. In a little while, when he's comfortable, sometimes when he's happy... Shut up, Charlie, you're talking far too much. Drop the gun, my hair. Drop it. Drop it, Furs. If you fire at one of us, you'll get a full charge from Decker in your back. You didn't hit me quite hard enough, Furs. Nice work, Charlie. Oh, me? Oh, uh, I always talk. He keeps them occupied. You hear him, Decker? See the way his little mouth opens? All right. Take a look at this fist of mine. <laughs> get him, Charlie! Get after him! Constanta! Constanta! Quick! Jump! There. Now. Get down and keep down. Thank God there's a mist. Constanta? Only a little. The mist is thick. Yes, thank heavens for that. If we lie quietly without starting the engine, there's not much chance they'll find us in this. I cross my fingers. Yes. Where do you think we are? Mm, somewhere off Crabben's Club. About midstream, I should say. What do we do? Nothing. They're coming closer. Yeah. Could be mine Herr Rona. Could be the customer's launch, but we can't risk it. They're beating around in a circle, hoping to pick us up. We just sit here, like this. Yeah, just drift. It's the only thing we can do. The moment we open up the engine, they'll hear us. When we've drifted far enough from them, we'll take a chance on it and try to hit Timmy Hamilton. Trouble is, in this mist, I, I've lost my bearings. I love you. And I love you. I hope my boy approves of you. Otherwise, it'll be the first disagreement we've ever had. You must be a nice boy. You think he'll like me? Mm, he's got his father's good taste. Alan, mm. I think I'm afraid. If you want me to be honest, I think I am too. But we'll get through. We must. I haven't heard them for a long time. No, either the cruiser has drifted well away or lying quiet, hoping we'll open up. I think we'll risk it. Oh, all right, then. Sometime we've got to. There have been many risks since all this began, with Sloiter wanting a passage to Holland and a certain Constanta Stratzma meeting the Arletta at Fera. It was fortunate that she did, for her. Mm. And for me. Right. We'll risk it now. All right? Yes. I'll take the tiller. We 
Bring the tiller over. The Inclemite must be over there. They're bound to hear us. The cruise is about. Can't help that. All we want now is speed. We've got to get ashore. They're after us. Oh, get down. They aren't far behind. There's the cruise. Through the fog. They've cut the motor back. They're coming right in. Alan, land. It's T. Hamilton. When we hit the sand, run for it and keep on running. All right, my dear Rona. Stay where you are. You expect me to stay here, Mr. Firth? I'm coming up. Come on, then. And take what you get. Charlie, take it. You stay here. Be ready to start as soon as I come back. I'll settle with Mr. Furs once and for all. Oh, we'll see about that. If only this damned fog would lift. Are you there, Mr. Furs? I'm in here, Rona. Yeah, I'm here. We can still make a bargain, Furs. <sighs> I told you once it would be up to you what kind of a deal we made at the last moment. A friendly one. Got a blazes, Rona. Ah, thank you, Mr. Furs. I know where you are now. Hello, Mr. Furs. I haven't a gun. You remember, I don't really like them. Very gentlemanly. But I better warn you. The jewels, Mr. Furs. The jewels. I haven't got them. Damn you, don't fool me. I haven't got them, Rona. That strut's my woman, I suppose. Stay where you are. So she's got them. On the contrary, Rona, I have them. Huh? Molna! Dr. Molna! Devil. We have our methods. A little slower than your own, perhaps, but a little shorter, I think. You were waiting, Inspector? We were waiting, Mr. Furs. And I wouldn't attempt to run for it, Brona. I think we already have Charlie and Decker in good hands. We have you surrounded. Blast you! Sergeant, take him down to the others. As for you, Mr. Furs... <laughs> well, we'll talk about you later. At the moment, I have a job to finish. I think you'll find Miss Strutzma waiting for you up on the road. You find her. The fog's lifting now. That was The House of the Seven Flies by Victor Canning, adapted by Kenneth Owen. The part of Alan Furze was played by James McKechnie, Constanta Strachma by Julia Lang, Herman Molnar by John Hollis, Charlie by John Durth, Ninas Rona by Malcolm Hayes, and Anselm Decker by Peter Clawton. Jan Beutelman was played by Philip Lever, Mrs. Beutelman by Catherine Wilmer. Postmaster, Hayden Jones. And the captain, Norman Wynn. Rosemary Martin as a confidential agent in Poison in the Air by Nick McCarty. Poison in the Air. He was late. He was always late. Across the street, the old Fords, ancient Vauxhalls, and the new Japanese motors surged through the capital of the British motor industry. Two men loitered on a corner. A third saw something he didn't like and turned fast down towards the old Gas Street Basin. A few tarted up narrow boats. The Gin and Twinset Brigade carefully not there today. It was Monday, Birmingham, and a grey day. Or it might have been the dirt on the office window. He was late, and he was tight-fisted, and scared, of course. I, I, I don't want you getting any ideas, Miss Sib. I mean, I, I'm taking you on as a fully-fledged operative for a number of reasons. Oh, I'm not again women's lib and all that. It, it's the fact that, that now it's, it's all takeover bids and run the men out of town. I, I, I'm not having that. I, I took this business on. I built it up, Miss Sib. Uh, uh, just don't get any ideas, Miss Sib. Uh, Do I get an office? You what? An office? You've got an office here. This is reception, Mr. Antrobus. Well, it's reception and your office now, isn't it? I suppose you don't mind answering a phone now and again, do you? Now and again, I don't. No. Mr. Parker, I am still the boss. 
Um, you've got a fake glow. You stopped smoking, Mickey. You promised. He looked up at the softly turning fan through the silver grey smoke and shook his head. The gun made a soft sound. The man in the swivel chair turned round twice, stopped and pitched forward with a hole where his right eye used to be. The boss nodded at the corpse. Take it down to the bay, dump it, he said. Across the room, a large blue fly woke up and began to take notice. There was blood on the wall behind the corpse and blood on the desk. The large blue fly took off in a heavy flight over the old carpet, past the fat operative and dive-bombed the hole in the back of the skull. It was a normal day, Monday. Not a single case... It's all do the letters, Miss Parker. Take the petty cash to the bank, Miss Parker. Take a note, Miss Parker. Lizzie keeps things to himself. He's like that. He's pushing his luck as Antrobus. I'm fed up, me. It's not right, is it? There's a sort of token agreement. Yes, you can have the job. And then nothing. It's as if men are scared if we're clever, scared if we're quicker, scared if we offer any sort of competition. That's the truth. All I want is equality. That says I can walk all over all men. I just want to do the job. Liz Parker, private investigator. Morning, morning, morning. Uh, with me, Gloria. Letter to do. Busy, Miss Parker? Hold on, hold up. You busy? Uh, Glor, a letter. No, I'm not. I'm sorry? Not busy. Unless counting the paper clips is busy. I want work. You promised. I could set up my own thing, you know, I could. <laughs> Already she's into competition. Already after my throat. That my mother used to say... You promised. Uh, uh, no. I said you had been promoted to private investigator. That's all. An operative in the ACE agency. That's all. But you said... You're not taking me seriously. Oh, yes. Yes, Miss Parker. <laughs> Patience in this business is a virtue, as my mother used to say. Gloria, a letter. Letters. Who's he kidding? Have you ever noticed how a man can say what he likes to a spinster and get away with it? We're supposed to be grateful? As if being without a husband is a mark of failure? He wouldn't be rude to his wife. Betrayer, yeah. Antrobus does that all the time, but never rude. And not to Gloria. But me, all the time. I'm just typewriter fodder to him. So what have I got to look forward to? Going home of a night to me dad, who's always moaning about the cold and the food and the fact that I go to work. I left home once, 20 years nearly, and then Mum died and, well, he couldn't boil an egg, so what could I do? Go home and bang my life down the pan. Left the job. Left freedom. Left the little flat in Wolverhampton. It wasn't much, but it was freedom for me. And now, him at home and me out on the number nine buzz along Broad Street every morning. In here. Antrobus sees me a spinster and he sees failure. As if catching a hunk of flesh like him was success. Daft, I call it. Uh, excuse me, the ace agency? It was a vicar. He put his shining face round the door, pushed and walked in. He was short and going to seed slowly. Tweed jacket, a badge with an obi joyful smile over it in his lapel and the same to match on his anxious face. Slightly balding and out of breath from all the stairs. Or the dubious magazines he can't have avoided on his way up the passage. He seemed guilty, like a small boy with a dirty secret. He glanced about, wet his lips with a little pink tongue, and began to back out again. Uh, uh, tell me, sorry, I seem to have made a mistake. No, this is it, the ace agency. What can we do for you, vicar? I, uh, well, you see, it's not exactly... I'm not used to this sort of thing, in fact. To tell the truth, a bit out of my depth. 
A, a donation for the tower, perhaps more, my line. Not sure what the Ace Agency management say to donations. Uh, I'll give you 50p. Oh. Which tower? Oh, it's uh, Sparkwick Parish Church. You may know it. It's quite a well-known Gothic sort of, uh, well, Victorian copy of a French... Uh, well, typically a Birmingham piece of... It's falling down. Let's forget it. No, come in. Tell us your problem. We're here to help Vicar. Uh, Mrs Williamson suggested I should ask for help. It's a delicate matter. One that requires the greatest of tact. Marjorie Williamson? Yes. A friend, she said, of uh, Miss uh, Parker. Me? Oh, oh, I see. Well, nice to meet you, of course. Maybe I'm jumping the gun a bit. Take some more dictation, Gloria. <laughs> I, uh, well, Miss Parker... Um, take no notice, Reverend. Uh, thin walls, you know. Perhaps I could call back another time, if necessary. I'm being a bit hasty. It's nothing a bit of prayer might not sort out. I find God is a wonder worker, Miss Parker, don't you? Uh, we could do special rates for the church, I suppose. Well, very kind, I'm sure, but... Maybe another time. God bless. Damn, Mickey Antrobus. <laughs> oh, Mr. Antrobus. Oh, Miss Parker. You'll have a heart attack, you will. <clears throat> it's your age. I don't, I, 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 I don't know what you mean. There was a vicar here. Hmm? These walls are paper thin. He took fright. Now, there's no need to take that tone. I'd remind you, I am still the boss. And how is your good lady going to feel when she hears you lost us a job? I, oh, Vickers. <laughs> He'll be looking for the charity job. As my old mother used to say, Mickey, my boy, charity is fine for them that has too much. For you and me, no charity. Anyway, let him without cast the first brick. As your old mother used to say... It had been a Brummagem Monday. Nothing had happened. The vicar looked a nice little man. Bit sad, really, under the joy in the Lord looks. Troubled. That stuff with Gloria and Mr A had not helped. I was cross and I left early. I hate wasted days and Grey Monday had been wasted all right, I thought. Liz. Oh, you look a bit down in the dumps. Come in. And oh, hold on. The baby's crying again. I never knew. Oh, don't you be stupid, Liz. I'm looking after him for Jane, my niece. You remember? You want to see him? Oh, oh he's delicious. No, thanks. Lovely baby. <laughs> and she gurgled and cooed at this little pink thing. I've never understood the attractions of them. Spitting and yelling. But a look at Margie's face as she looks down on that little scrap. It's a dream come true. You're busy, Marge. I'll come back later. Only come round for a end of a pint of milk. Dad forgot to get any. I had a phone call from the Reverend Williams. He seemed confused. He caught us at a bad time. What's the problem? Oh, ask him. He'll be in the church. About half past eight, he said it'd be best. No one is around then. I said you'd be round. He's busy, so don't keep him waiting, will you? I've got to go and see to my little man. <laughs> see yourself out, Liz. It had been one of the richer suburbs of the city, Sparkwick. I used to come and visit an old aunt when Mum was alive, on the tram from town. Rattling and rolling, hissing and pinging along the metal rails out of the centre of the city. The lovely yellow wooden seats had movable backs, so you always faced the way you wanted. The curling stairs to the top of the tram. Long, narrow, smoke-filled and rolling from side to side, like a sort of blue and yellow ship. I used to run away from Mum and Dad and along the purple flag pavements under the sycamore trees, hide up entries and jump out on them, laughing as they laughed and held hands and... We were all younger then. I hadn't been in Sparkwick since Mum died. 
people live in a place that's perfectly nice and run it down, I mean, deliberately ruin it. St Barnabas and St Catherine's. There was even graffiti on the churchyard walls. Progress. I turned past the black grime stone wall of the churchyard and through the gate, past the notice warning that the second coming was near and the suggestion that Jesus loved us all, I looked around and wondered why. I was a bit out of my depth yesterday. A bit surprised. Surprised? But to find myself where I was, the ace agency. People find it hard to talk about things. I know I do. Nice flowers. Yes. Yes, one of the old ladies does them. Marjorie sometimes comes over to help. Down the aisle of the church, a cold draft winds, and I suddenly felt sorry for him. This dumpy little man trying to face up to life in the city and really dreaming. Dreaming, no doubt, of cricket on the village green, Panama hats and stands the clock at half past three. And what's his little lot? Rasters in tea cosy hats, graffiti kings spraying invitations to do unmentionable things and a cold, cold church. He'd make no difference in the long run. And then he got to the point. So I am vicar to a small residential home. Yes. Old people, retired people, single people. In their own places, but with someone there to see they're all right. I've been trying to get my father to look at one near us. No chance. Well, we have a problem there. A lot of unhappiness, distress. Go on. It saddens me to talk about it to a stranger. This is between us, isn't it? Uh, these four walls. The problem? Poison letters. Oh, nasty. How many? Uh, six that I know of. There are eight units on the site. Uh, they're, they're very nice. Little gardens and adequate single-storey housing with a warden. Someone to do the shopping, if necessary. A doctor calls. I call. A little common room for telly or a sing-song. It's very nice. Why would anyone want to send poison letters. Have you seen any? Yes. It's sickening. They're very disturbed. You should tell the police. They won't let me. They don't want fuss. I just want it stopped. Oh, I'm sure you do. My boss, Mr. Antropus, is going to ask what's in it for the Ace Agency. Quite. Quite. Well, I'm not sure. We might do it for expenses and a small fee, seeing as it's for the elderly. No! No, you tell him, no chance. We're not bloody Lord Peter Whimsy and all that rubbish. This is a living we're talking about. Real life here, not Lord Muck and Ariadne in a pearl necklace. This is for real, Miss Parker. A small fee. A, a small fee. How small is small, eh? No, no, don't, don't tell me. My mother used to say to me, small fees is small cabbages is small, small potatoes is sweet damn all, Miss Parker. No. Mr Ray, these are old ladies, frightened old ladies. No, you, you keep out of it, Gloria. This is business. We do cheapos, the word gets round the ace agency is on the skids. Mm, when was it ever off? Gloria, enough. Miss Parker, you tell the Rev that for the right daily rate, plus X's, we'll sort it. Mr Ray, be reasonable. They can't afford... I can't afford charity. Charity begins at home. As your old mother used to say. I walked down the streets towards the sunshine homes. Open spaces and flower beds squared off. Way over the other side, a main road hummed. But here was quiet as a butterfly's wing. An old man in a flat cap helped an elderly lady up from a park bench overlooking the children's playground. The two of them smiled at each other and walked slowly away over the grass. Six children yelled the way they do and shook and twisted at a swing, trying to break it away from its moorings, the way kids do these days. None of them were smiling. In the park... Oh, Mr Burtish, uh, very nice old man. The only man we have, in fact, if he was wearing an old cloth cap and a suit. And the old lady? 
He was very popular. Was? Well, old people are very jealous of each other. Uh, friendships are jealously guarded. Squabbles don't heal easily. Vendettas are pursued as far as the grave in some cases. Oh, it's sad but true. On, on the other hand, anger pumps up the adrenaline. So you might say it keeps them going. Uh, a bit of love keeps them ticking, too, it seems. Mr Burtish has been snapped up. Really? Mrs Andrews, a widow about uh, two years younger than him. Not exactly love's young dream. She has bad arthritis, but it's nice to see. You keep an eye on them all the time? You try to keep out of their hair. We do pop in of an evening just to see they're settled. Do you have any of the letters? Just the one. They're very nervous. I believe there have been six. They seem scared by it. I'm not surprised. May I see the one you were given? Of course. It was uh, sent to Miss Bryce. She's been here a long time. Uh, not an easy woman to deal with, but very straightforward, if you catch her right. I'll try. Thank you. Don't think no one knows what you're doing. Everyone is talking about it. Disgusting. You can't hide it for much longer. The authorities are going to know soon. Oh, dear. Nasty, isn't it? Hints and, and, and sort of threats are, are nothing concrete. And we've all got something we'd rather people didn't know about. It's cruel. I haven't a guilty conscience. No secrets, no wild desires, nothing. Well... Getting a letter like that, half threats, half hints, terrible cruelty, just preying on their minds... I'll have a word with Mrs Bryce. Uh, Miss Bryce, a spinster lady. Then we'll have something in common, won't we? Fear in the air. Neat little gardens. Concrete paths swept clean. Net curtains. In the closed community that formed these eventide homes, terror stalked the ground. A postman's call, a trigger. The envelope onto the door in the morning. Guilt. Fear. Poison in the air. Two on the mat with the milk. Filth. Can I see one? Oh, I don't agree with all this fuss. Ignore it and it'll go away. It might. The room was as neat and sharp as Miss Bryce. The furniture she brought with her highly polished. Some photographs on the sideboard. Family, I suppose. She was well over 65 and firing on all cylinders. A hard face... Her grey hair sleeked back into a bun, her blue eyes sharp and darting. The only real sign of age was in her hands. They were knotted with arthritis. It was painful to watch her lift the teapot. Shall I pour? I won't be beholden. I won't. Oh, it'll come to you. No family, Miss Parker? Oh, it'll come to you. Yes, I suppose. Yes. I burnt the letters. Whoever sent them was just being wicked. If I was religious, I might pray for them. You're not? Oh, I can't stand God botherers. No. Stand on your own feet. Take what's coming. Get on with it. My way. If the others stop making a fuss, there'd be no need to get people like you bothering us. Some of them are very scared. Then they should ask their families to help. They've got people to lean on. I thought that's what families were for. You lean on yours? I get on by myself. Can you think of any reason why anyone should be sending these letters, Miss Bryce? Any reason at all? I do not intend to bother thinking about one. The letter, Mrs Barker. No. No, I don't want... I didn't keep it. I, I gave it to my son when he came to visit. He, he burned it. Now, if you don't mind, I'm not feeling too good. Have you had any more, Mrs Barker? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. My son said to ignore it. Burn them if I've got any more. Sorry. Yes? I just wanted a few minutes of your time. You were told I'd be calling. About the letters? No. Sorry. Nothing. Obviously. I told you. Waste of time, money and shoe leather. So what can I do? 
My mother used to say to me, oh. if the victims won't talk, you'll never get the guilty. Fact to life. Lesson learned. Call the Rev and tell him sorry, no go. I can't, Mr A. There are some very scared old ladies. If they won't help themselves, what can you do? I'll go back and see the old man. Oh. Have another chat with Miss Bryce. Jean Teelys. It's not your fault, is it? I thought I had a way with old people. Got enough practice with me old dad. Nothing. Stone walled me, all of them. Mm, that's it then. Oh, sad. Cheers, Glow. Cheers. I just hate giving up on it. Them. I got the call the next afternoon. Get down to Poison Pen Alley and see a man about this and that. I took off as Mr. Ray walked through the door. <coughs> Miss Parker. I want you to go and sit outside this place and check the movements of this party. I glanced at the photo and gave it back. Sorry, Mr Ray, I have to see a man about a letter. Yeah, Tomorrow... The, the, the point is, Miss Park... There's nothing on your desk, Mr Ray. <coughs> you could go. No, I've got a cold coming on and a sore throat, and my wife insists I stay here. Miss Parker! Hi, Aspreen. See you. The Sparkwick Arms. A reflection of the bad taste of the breweries and their so-called architects. A reflection of our times, my dad would say. Still, would you drink in a place that was plastic Spanish with overtones of third world grot? Billy and his lady were sitting over their drinks when I came in. They only had eyes for each other. Billy and Alice looked into each other's eyes like love's young dream. Nice, really. If you could forget where you were. Alice can tell you, girl. Nothing to do with us. You get letters like that, what do you do? I cried. I did. The last one I never showed you, Billy. Huh? It said things about you and me and, and my grandchildren. Nasty things. Unkind things. So it was someone who knew you had grandchildren? I'll oh, tear the throat out when I find them. She doesn't want to hear about that, Billy. I got over it. I was lucky. A trouble shared. You must find that with your hubby, Mrs. Parker. Well, not exactly. Not married. Well, it's not always what it's cracked up. So, Billy and me, we're happy enough, aren't we, love? Yes, we are. Uh, the letters. We don't have to talk about them letters anymore, do we? I, I just wondered if you knew what the other letters said. Oh, same old stuff. Nasty hints about guilty secrets and all that. Something about a relative or a grandchild? Always. Always what? A stuff about a relative, a grandchild, uh, something nasty. I saw Mrs. Barker's and Mrs. Adams's. They were very upset and came to me. But I never told you, Alice. Thought it might upset you. Same. <sighs> they won't talk to me at all. Only Miss Bryce and you two. The rest slam their doors and bolt and chain them. Fear, maybe. Take a lot to scare that Bryce woman. Alice, leave it. She had Billy round her little finger till I come along. Running errands or cutting lawns. Giving orders, expecting him to jump. No wonder she's on her own. Alice, she's all right. Take no notice, Liz. Hard as nails. Had to be, I suppose, in her work. But not very nice. Most people pass the time of day, smile, say good morning. Not her. Bit sad. Why? Well, I used to pop round to her place of a Tuesday, do things about the garden. I mean, I, I like a garden, me, and she hates gardening. So I tidy about, and suddenly one day, on your bike, told me to leave it alone. She didn't want me about no more. It was when Alice and me, um, you know. He was very hurt. Weren't you, Billy? I was more surprised. Cut off her nose to spite her face. Daft, I call that. It was about a week after Alice and me had been to the pictures together. <laughs> First time we went out. People might laugh or get daft and sentimental. Well, we're good for each other, oh. and that's a fact. <laughs> My son and his wife have met Billy. They like him. He's nice with the grandchildren. I like to see them together. Have they met your family, Billy? Don't have one, love. Wife and me, no kids. Just one of those things. 
I used to do a lot of work in youth clubs. Amateur dramatics, musical comedy, Ivan and Avello and all that. So Alice come along and I get a family ready made. <laughs> Here, drink up. My shout. You walk away from love like that into the city. Past decaying fences, dirty parks, broken benches. Past notices forbidding ball games, radios, picnics, litter, children. Through streets lit by occasional orange light. Past the glittering danger of corner pubs and the menace of dark alleys. You walk through the dying city and see only two old people looking fondly at each other over a beer-covered table. Sweet dreamers. Such sweet dreamers. And in the air, poison. You get a feeling that it's all obvious and you're not seeing the situation. Not seeing it clearly, and yet it's there in front of you. I went home and found Dad out and Marjorie sitting in her car in the street. You coming in then, Marge? Oh, just for a minute. Got to get back to take over the babysitting. It's bridge night, Marge. Oh, sorry, can't. Family comes first. Well, thanks a lot. Don't let me keep you. I can't help it, Liz. No need for you to go off the deep end. Well, it's just so casual, isn't it? What am I supposed to do with my evening now? Sit and look at the walls, is that it? Up to you. Well, thanks a million. Damn, damn, damn. How dare she? Family come first. Fa family. Cut. Nose off to spite face. Oh, wow! Marjorie, you have a great and uncanny skill. You know exactly how to hurt and you have just pointed me in the right direction. Great! The sad and the lonely, the damaged, the broken-hearted, the misfits and the old. Put them away behind shutters, behind bars, blinds. Hide them. Leave them in their small rooms and forget them. Old men and old women who forget from time to time to wash, forget to comb their hair, forget to clean, forget to eat, but forget nothing of their own pasts. In the city no one calls, no one cares, no one listens to them any more. Oh, well, she's a bit dotty now, of course, or I can't put up with the tantrums like a kid, so stubborn. In the dark, afraid to think about tomorrow. Miss Bryce is a lady of undoubted skills and talent, Miss Parker. As my wife reminded me last night, we had seen her on our honeymoon in Clacton, on the pier, or in the winter garden. It was a wet time we had there, I remember. Out of season, of course, and a bit cheaper. Now, my mother used to say, you don't miss anything but a bit of sunshine, so who's worried about sunshine? Oh, your old bird played and sang selections from Ivor Novello. <laughs> I remember it very well. Oh, Mr A, how romantic. <laughs> Maybe it was, Gloria. I forget that bit. <clears throat> me, I'm, I'm town deaf. I know a singer from a mutton chop, me. <laughs> now, now, my good lady wants her to sign something. A picture, maybe? Well, she's an old lady with arthritis. Well, she'll have a publicity picture. Theatricals always do. It's a, their egos. They don't give a damn for anyone till it's too late. I mean, nothing matters. Family, friends, children, all go hang. All for a career in the Winter Gardens Clacton. <laughs> oh, I ask you, I mean, is that a career? Glor, will you be in later? Yeah, why? I might want a favour. I'll ring you. Uh, but, Mr... D I, I, hold on, I... Oh, damn it. Easy, isn't it? When you're listening properly. Hints and nods. And then suddenly, clear as a bell. I am quite sure, Miss Perkins. Parker. Oh. No family at all? Not as far as I'm aware. I, I think you should know something. I received one of these letters. I'm ashamed to say I did nothing about it. Have you still got it? It's there. It, it, it's awful. It says nothing specific. And the threats are so... so specific? Mm. Public disgrace, drag through the dirt, abominable practices. Yes. Yes, it's sad, really. It's terrifying. 
What does the writer know? Probably nothing. But you get a letter and you, you can't be sure, can you? Exactly. So, Miss Price has no family? Not as far as I'm aware. Damn! Oh, sorry. The Rev's dead wrong. They never come and visit her, though. Her son never comes near her, nor his wife. Never bring the kid over. Nothing. Are you quite sure? She used to have a photo of the kid on the mantelpiece. I was in there fixing a plug for her and she told me there'd been a row. Not seen hide in her hair since. Do you know where they live? No chance. Try the warden. He might know. Agency, your problem solved. Matrimonial debts, wills, and personal problems. No, it's me. Telly Snips. We've got to collect a package. You'll need the car. Yeah, right. Oh, I was never really the top. More well as the vulgar might say. Amongst the wines and spirits. Sorry? Wines and spirits by... At the bottom of the bill. Not a measure of my talent. More a lack of luck on my part. I see. I played some nice places... The summer season, Torquay, Bournemouth. I played the winter gardens at Eastbourne, the grand at Harrogate. The pier at Clacton. Clacton? Why did you know that? A friend of mine recognised the name. His wife, actually. Was your husband in the same line of business? My husband? It was a salesman, moving about to make a living. Yeah, I suppose, till he died. Died, Miss Bryce? He left you, didn't he? Yes, he left me. Yes. Men. Unreliable creatures. You have a son? No. No. It's not what I heard, Miss Bryce. You have a son and a daughter-in-law and... Who told you that? I checked. A son, then. You see him? You will know I don't see him, Miss Parker, I'm sure. You should never have married. I told him he was a fool. She'd be no good for him. None at all. Useless. I warned him. And you don't see him or her? I've no wish to see him or her. Nor your grandson? I don't want to talk about it. Just go away and leave me alone. Oh, please, just mind your own business. You don't write to him. Don't call him. Never. I've always found, Miss Parker, that a decision once made is one less trouble in the world. I make up my mind to do something, and that is that. I told him I'd no wish to see her again. He said if that was the case, then I couldn't expect him to come and see me. Very well, I said. That's so lonely, Miss Bryce. <laughs> Trailing about the dreadful bed sitting rooms and boarding houses like I've done. Playing the piano to audiences who never listened. Playing Ivan Novella medleys and tea rooms in Clacton. You don't think that was lonely? I'm sorry. I don't need pity. I was thinking about your grandson, who was never going to know his grandma or hear her play the piano. Never going to hear the stories she can tell him, the excitements and the romance even, more than most people. You got away, lived. It's something more than most people. You, Miss Parker? Me, Miss Bryce? Trapped by demanding old father. Dragged back from freedom to the fold. I made an escape and I allowed duty to drag me back. I'm sorry? I'm not, usually. I care for him and he needs me and, you know, it's roots, isn't it? Cutting them away will be so cruel, so... I'm not so very sorry for myself. Am I? Are you, Miss Bryce? I remember once I was on bills with... Arthur Askey and Trinder and Rowerton Landar. Fine pianists. They like my work. <laughs> Told me so. And Ziegler and Webster Booth. <laughs> Such fun we had. I really want to hear. Can we go for a walk? It's such a nice day. Did you know Henry Hall? I remember as a kid listening to him on the radio. And we walked away from the sheltered housing and down the road to the park. I just hope Gloria had done a good job at her end. Miss Bright never stopped. Once she got wound up, it came out in a stream, as if she'd been waiting, just waiting for someone to talk to about those lovely, long, lonely days playing rotten pianos in concert parties, tea rooms, winter gardens, ballrooms and for amateur operatics. Lonely, of course, but with the occasional excitement. 
I said then, never again, living out of a suitcase. I did my best, sent my son to school. He came to me in the holidays. <laughs> Hung around waiting for me to finish. Hung around theatres and tatty digs. No, no old coward promised me a tour on a cruise line. He's been kind. Never happened, of course. Dreams. We walked down to the swings and she went on talking, not looking around. So many dreams and hopes. Then I couldn't play so easily. My hands began to stiffen up. Arthritis. I managed to get work in the tea rooms and then in the winter did the occasional work for the local amateur operatics. It was so lonely. Grandma! Gloria waved to me from the car. I walked over, left the old lady and her grandson to it. This was the easy bit. We drove them home for tea. Come on, Gran. I want some chocolate biscuits. Law, take him to buy some chocolate digestives. Ten minutes. We'll put the kettle on. OK. And Miss Bryce and I got out of the car and did to her house. She didn't really know what to say. It had been a nice day, I suppose. I have a job to do, Miss Bryce. I'm sure I don't know what I have to do with that. Everyone who had a letter, a nasty, poisonous letter, has a grandchild, family, visitors, everyone except you. And what's that got to do with me, Miss Parker? You were cross when Billy began to go out with Alice, jealous. He suddenly had family again. You'd rowed with your daughter-in-law and your son. Oh, it's not your business. The letters are. You wanted attention. You wanted someone to take notice of you. You spent your life playing theatres and clubs and dining rooms and you never made it, but you went on and on, just getting attention. And then it was all over. And you even cut off family and friends. Cut off your nose to spite your face, Miss Bryce. And then who was going to take notice? I've been 50 years more travelling from place to... I thought maybe here just for once I'd settle... People had talked to me. I'd have time for family and... Yes, I ride with my son. I ride with Billy. People stayed away from me. It, it got out of hand. And I wrote letters. I had to take notice then. It, it all got out of hand. I wanted to stop, but I couldn't. I just wanted some friends for once. Someone to just drop in and chat. To see my grandson every so often. And you scared those old ladies just to get attention. What are you going to do about the letters? I don't think there will be any more, do you? If there were, then maybe you wouldn't see your grandson again. Blackmail, Miss Parker. <laughs> yes, Miss Bryce. One more bit of blackmail. There's a piano needs playing in the church hall. A small concert for the Tower Appeal. A little private penance, Miss Bryce? But, but my hands are... My arthritis... No I... one will mind the occasional mistake, I'm sure. Uh, Miss Parker, I don't know what to say. Uh, you've made my wife's weak. Try thank you, Michael. <laughs> Miss Parker, I'm really looking forward to this concert. Oh. It brings back such happy memories. Doesn't it, Michael? Yeah. Doesn't it? Um. Funny. Simple things can do the most terrible damage. A little family row a refusal to see the other side of the coin, and suddenly a whole neighbourhood is terrorised. Whispers and allegations, threats and poison in the air. And now, Ivan Avello across the mean and dirty streets of the city, past the graffiti on the churchyard wall, beyond the notice telling us to repent, in a dirty, scruffy church hall, an old lady struggles painfully through old memories, old dreams, 
old and failed aspirations, and some old people sing and remember their own past glories. Who's counting? I am. Fees. The vicar told me he paid. Not in the book, Miss Parker. No. Well, you see, the concert last night was for the tower of the church. No. You never wanted to do the job, you said. Your mother said never work with reverence, no charity work. Exactly. So, the fee, if you please. Well, it's not as easy as that. There were tickets to buy. Tickets? Well, you don't think a professional musician is going to do it for nothing, do you? Miss Bryce is a member of the Musicians' Union, union rate, and something for the tower fund. The fee? The, the whole fee? Yeah, I paid the lot in. Your old mother was right, Mr A. Never do charity work. <laughs> <laughs> In Poison in the Air by Nick McCarty, Liz Parker was Rosemary Martin, Antrobus, Terry Malloy, Gloria, Claire Falkenbridge, Dad, Roger Hume, Marjorie, Barbara Atkinson, Anne, Joyce Gibbs, Vicar, Simon Carter, Supervisor, Alton Douglas, Billy, Ralph Lawton, Alice, Vida Warwick, Mary, Judy Bennett. The pianist was Harold Rich. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Poison in the Air was directed in our Pebble Mill studios by Philip Martin. From Detective Sergeant Charles McGregor, Scotland Yard. November 2nd, 1966. Application for transfer number 142. I know Chief Inspector Dover has never let evidence stand in the way of a good arrest, but in the case of the Sleeping Beauty, he took this to a whole new dimension. It all began to go wrong when the Chief Constable of Curdsley wasn't there to pick us up at the station. Don't dawdle with those cases. It's a long way from the train to the police station. Not my fault. They don't oh. do taxis in Kurdsley. Shop? Anybody here? Uh, can I help you? Dunno, who are you? Chief Constable Muggle. I- I'm not usually on the front desk. You were you? supposed to meet me off the train. Name Dover, ring a bell? Oh, oh Chief Inspector, terribly sorry. No, no, I assumed you'd be driving up. He prefers the train because motor cars don't have restaurants. That'll do. Well, I suppose mistakes happen, especially up north. Uh, I, w- well, it's, it's good to meet you. Right now, I expect you'll be wanting to know about the Sleeping Beauty. The what? The case we've come up to solve, sir? Now that, all in good time. First off, where's my billet? Ah, uh, you'll be staying with me. Uh, Mrs. Muckle insisted. She a good cook. The best. Say no more. Come on, laddie. Pick up the cases. Uh, where am I staying, sir? Oh, well, I haven't really... Uh, you can th- drop my sergeant off at some cheap and cheerful B&B. No need to break the bank. Oh, oh good. Uh, sir. Oh, stop moaning. Wins, wins, wins. Noon tonight. Do your men give you this much, Jim? So the victim, Miss Isabel Slatcher, was shot eight months ago. Aye, but she only died Tuesday morning. That's why we called you lads in. It's murder now. What took her so long? She was in an irreversible coma. Hence, the sleeping beauty. Poor thing. Malingering, I'd say. She got a boyfriend? A fiancé, yes. Uh, Gerald Butt. He did it. Uh, Chief Inspector. Don't contradict me. You're not even married. So, where was this woman shot? And don't say in the head. She was shot at 8.15pm. The first Friday in March outside the local Protestant church. 
She was often there helping the minister, Reverend Bonington. Nice man. Are you religious, Chief Inspector? Ah, hey. Sorry, sir. I believe in law, truth and justice, and that rights will always prevail. I hope your wife's got supper ready. So who found the body, sir? The Reverend heard some shots and rushed out with his housekeeper to find Gerald Butt cradling his fiancée in his arms. Told you. Got him banged to rights. Just fit him in before the milksops ban hanging. What about the gun, sir? It was apparently a German Luger, but it was never found. How far is this ruddy ass? Not far. We can drop the sergeant off here. Percy Arms, hope it's all right for you, lad. It'll be fine. The rougher, the better. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chief Constable. Well, see you tomorrow then, sir. Is there anyone else we should be talking to? Yes, the real fly in the ointment. Violet Slatcher. The victim's older sister. She's a devout Protestant, and she thinks we're not doing our job because the police around here are nearly all Catholic. It all dates back to the 16th century and old Henry VIII. I'm sure it does, but like old Henry, I need food now. <coughs> we investigate all cases with the same thoroughness. That would be why I've been brought in, then. Well, enjoy your supper, sir. I shall. Mmm, I can almost smell it. Here we are, Chief Inspector, with my oh. famous spinach and cream cheese bake. Wonderful. Elaine, pass the serving spoon, would you? Can't beat a nice big start. Uh, this is the main course, Chief Inspector. <laughs> Northern humour. Love it. No, uh, Mrs. Muckle and I well, were strict vegetarians. Vegetarians? We don't believe in slaughtering God's creatures for food, do we, Humphrey? <laughs> but God wanted us to have chops. It's in the Bible. Oh, I'm not sure about that, Chief Inspector. But our Lillian had know. Wasn't your pet? I don't like the Bible much. Oh. But I like poetry. <laughs> <laughs> How doth the little crocodile improve his shining tail <sighs> and pour the waters of Nile on every gold scale? Children, vegetarians, how neat poetry, his my cup running. And welcomes oh. little fishes in with gentle, smiling joy. Uh, I'll get the phone. I've got her the best elocution teacher in Kersley. Doesn't she speak lovely? Lovely. Hello? Yes. Oh, I'll pass you on. Dearest. Oh, excuse me? Would you like to hear another poem? Oh, you better can it, Lillian, oh. so Daddy can take his call. Right now, no yep. big caution for you, Chief uh, Inspector. A bit more. Uh, there you are. What? Lillian, it's your favourite. Are you sure? Place. There you are. Okay, I will we'll, 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 we'll be right there. Uh, uh, Thank you. I'm afraid the Chief Inspector and I will have to go, look. Oh, what a pity. Summing up like a barbecue, maybe? That was a hospital. They've just done the post-mortem. So? They've discovered Isabel Slatcher didn't die of her gunshot wounds. Hey, eh? Then what the hell did she die of? Suffocation. Suffocated? Hmm. She looks so peaceful, doesn't she? How, Doctor? With the pillow, Sergeant. Well, Dr. Austin, that's a turn up for the books. Head over. Not compared to the shop I've just had. How was the pump? Oh, wonderful, thank you, sir. Best lamb chops I've ever tasted. Oh. <laughs> Could we possibly get back to this poor dead girl? Oh, sorry. sorry. We were just about to start the post-mortem when the nurse who was stripping Isabel Slatcher's bed reported that one of the pillowcases was stained with lipstick. Lipstick? We thought this was a bit odd, but we found the answer when we opened her up. See? Mm. Asphyxiation. It was presumably the pillow that suffocated her. Well, this makes a big difference, doesn't it, sir? Suppose so. Means of ever shot and came back to finish the job. The fiancé, obviously. How many lamb chunks? Three. <sighs> Lovely and juicy they were. <coughs> um, but why would they need to do that? If she was in a coma and was going to die anyway, she was going to die, wasn't she, Doctor? Oh, inevitably. Poor woman. I want all this kept secret, you understand? Oh. You want more to think she just died from the shooting? Exactly. Oh, I suppose we'd better see that nurse who found her. You'll have to go through the matron. I warn you, she's formidable. She ain't matched Dover of the Yard. <laughs> Sit down and listen. Yes, yes matron. matron. This is probationer Nurse Pearson. Hello. Tell them what you found, dear. Well, I found... The lipstick stain was in the centre of the bottom pillow, facing down towards the sheets. Whoever killed Miss Slatcher must have taken a pillow from under her head, suffocated the poor woman, then slipped the stained pillow back underneath. 
Anything else, Chief Inspector? Uh, yes, actually. Nurse Pearson. Well, I... You want to know why on earth a comatose woman was wearing lipstick? Well, it was a specific request from her sister. Her sister? It was for the newspaper pictures, sir. What newspaper pictures? That'll do, Ness. I have to go on the evening rounds now. You gentlemen can accompany me. Uh, okay. okay. What happened was this, Chief Inspector. Good evening, Dr. Hurst. Good evening. On Thursday, our local newspaper, the Kirtley Custodian, published a completely spurious and irresponsible article that Miss Slatcher, the sleeping beauty they called her, sleeping maybe, beauty hardly, was on the verge of recovery and would regain consciousness within the next few days. Good Lord. And if she awoke, she'd tell the police who shot her. I'll do the conclusions, lady. Why the hell did they print that? What's the dead girl's sister got to do with all this? Violet Swatcher, who incidentally is a good deal older than Isabel, but just as plain, is a rather unbalanced woman, Chief Inspector, and was totally devoted to her sister. She said that now this story had suddenly appeared, for whatever reason, reporters from London had surely want to take pictures. Of a comatose girl? A very famous comatose girl. What about the fiancé? Gerald Butt. Yeah. He's in the RAF. He was coming in to see her on the Tuesday morning. Hang on, so her fiancé was here exactly the time she died. I suppose so, but... I told you, McGregor. He read the newspaper article and realised he had to finish the job he started eight months ago. Good morning, Mrs. Jackson. How are you? Not too bad. Smothered with a pillar in her own hospital bed. Smothered? Sorry, Mrs. Jackson, not you. Enjoy your supper. Does she need all that, damn it? Yeah. Who was supposed to be looking after Isabel Slatcher on the Tuesday she died... That nurse Horncastle. She'll be back on duty in the morning. Job for you, McGregor. I've got to find a pie shop still open or kill a cow or something. If I don't find one, I'm coming back to eat Mrs. Jackson. What did he say? So there he was again, going at it like a bull in a china shop. But this time, I had a few special cards in my hand when I went to pick up the chief inspector. You must be Sergeant McGregor. The Chief Inspector is just coming. McGregor, get me a card, did you? Yes, sir. Uh, so you have got that, Chief Inspector? Not if I see you first. Oh, bye, then. So what they gave me this morning to say this. Ouch! <laughs> what am I? Bloody Grand National. Isn't it? I had sausages. I've never no. seen so many sausages. <laughs> Must have been at least... Yeah, all right. <laughs> so what did Nurse Hardwick say? Horncastle. Well, she did show the fiancé, uh, Gerald Butt, into Miss Slatcher's hospital room on Tuesday morning and left him alone there. Uh, open a shut case, get the black cat ready and book our tickets home. Make sure there's a buffet car. But do you think we should go to the RAF base and question Mr. Butt there? You want to look at the planes, don't you? No. Well, if we've got time. <laughs> You'd have loved these sausages, sir. McGregor. Sir. There's our man. Now, don't tell him we know about the smothering. Let him dig his own grave. Okay, sir. But I think we should go gently, you know? I do know the rules, Sergeant. Oh, look at that lovely plane. Isn't that a beauty, sir? Uh, excuse me, pilot officer. Is that a genuine hunter? Yes, it is, actually. I've never seen one quite so close up. Uh, can I get in the cockpit and have a look? Of course not. Right. Well... Would you mind telling me about the night of March the 16th? Hmm? No. What's that got to do about playing? Come on, laddie. Oh, on my throat. What are you doing? Just answer, oh. Biggles. Where were you on the night of March 16th? Uh, sir, actually, we know where he was. Reverend Bonington found him outside the church cradling his fiancée's body. Well, I'm asking him, laddie. Where did you get the gun, eh, Sunshine? Speak, man, or it'll go all the worse for you. I don't think he can speak, sir. Not with your thumbs on his windpipe. Softy, okay. Oh. There you go. Oh. See, he's off. Look at that. Guilty as hell. Catch him, McGregor. I'll get him, sir. Dover oh. gets his man again. Don't know how I do it. Got him, sir. Well, drag him over here. I'm not Superman. Why were you running, son? Because you were trying to kill me, and I've no idea oh. who you are. Ah, <laughs> that old chestnut. Oh, uh, well, he does have a point, sir. We didn't actually say who we were. Oh, no, we didn't. Sorry about that, son. Uh, we're from Scotland Yard, Pilot Officer Butt. Scotland Yard? So you're policemen? Yes, we're investigating the murder of Isabel Slatcher. Oh, poor Isabel. 
She didn't deserve that. Still, she's out of her misery now. Don't give me that malarkey, Sunshine. You shot her in cold blood then. What? Uh, sir, may I? Uh, Mr. Butt, I understand that you and the late Miss Slatcher were engaged to be married. Well, no, actually. There wasn't any engagement. We were just good friends. If I've heard that once... Sir! Uh, can you tell us what happened, pilot officer? That night, eight months ago. Uh, well, could I maybe get up my legs? They're... Oh, yes. Sorry. Oh. Would you like to walk? Yes, please. Walk? Ah, oh. Get the circulation going again in his legs. Look at that one, sore. What a machine. <laughs> Never been inside one before. Uh, Mr. Butt, do you think we could at least have uh, a... Still, no. You wanted to talk about that awful night. Suppose so. Well, it was a Saturday evening. I'd agreed to meet Isabel at the church when she was finished doing what she was doing for Reverend Bonington. Why were you meeting? I never found out, did I? Anyway, somebody must have been waiting for her. Yes, you with the gun. No, I wasn't even the first to find her. I'll never forget that night. The church organ was playing. Reverend Bonington came out with his housekeeper, Mrs. Horsley. They'd heard the shots. Then they ran back inside to phone the police. I'd heard the shots too. From the high street. So I came running. They found me kneeling beside the body. Where's the gun? I've no idea. Okay, no more kid gloves. Kid gloves? You nearly struck I'm talking. You saw that article in the local paper, got the willies, and decided to pay your recovering fiancé a little visit. So I visited her on Tuesday. What's that got to do with anything? Not tell it. No. Well, I did see the article. I was rather pleased, obviously. Ah. But then, of course, she died. But it was Violet, Isabel's sister, who asked me to go round there in my uniform. She said there'd be photographers. Her sister asked you to visit? Yes, of course. Why else would I... I'm tired of this poppycock. Listen, pilot officer, whatever your name is, don't want you going anywhere. But I'm in the RAF. Don't answer back. You'll only make things worse. Oh. Okay. Uh, can you take your hands off the plane, please, Sergeant? Oh, please. So, sir, what do you think? Well, he was on the scene both times, and he had a motive. What motive? Don't know yet. Well, do you think we should see that newspaper article? Why? We know what it says. The Kersley Custodian building is right next to the pub I'm staying in. We could speak to the editor and then grab some lunch. You're getting the hang of this, McGregor. Mm -hmm. Except maybe we'll do it the other way round. You've called me at a busy time, gentlemen. Hope you're not asking me to hold the front page. <laughs> Listen, matey, I've just had the first decent meal in ages, and I'm wasting valuable snoozing time. Mr. Gossage, who wrote the article on Isabel Slapshire? As a matter of fact, I did. Oh, she's big news in this town. The Sleeping Beauty, best thing that's happened since... Oh, that's terrible. Really terrible. Where did you get your information from about her imminent recovery? Ah, uh, sorry, old chap. A newspaper man would rather die than reveal his source of... <coughs> that can be a right. No, oh, no, not again. Chief hey, Inspector, he's going blue. Oh, all right. Oh! You sissy. If you don't tell me where you got your facts from, I'll stick your private parts in that printing press right between the horoscope and a sports page. It, it, it was the girl's elder sister, Violet Slatcher. What? Does this button switch everything off? What, what are you doing? I'm holding the front page. Violet Slatcher? The woman's been coming to see me. Every month or so, trying to get me to feature the case in the paper. Right after the shooting, it was a damn good story. But, well, victim still unconscious, no recovery expected. It did get a bit boring. But you printed this story. Curdsley's own sleeping beauty on the verge of waking up and naming her attacker. That was news. Did it ever strike you that it wasn't true? Yeah, it did cross my mind. After what the doctors kept saying... But the girl's own sister ought to know, oughtn't she? Um, can I have my newspaper back, please? Don't like churches. I can't imagine they like you much, you <laughs> Violet Slatcher's cleaning lady said she'd be at the vicarage. We don't actually need to go into the church, sir. Thank God for that. So, this must be where the Slatcher girl was shot. 
It's sort of creepy, isn't it? Nah. I'm surprised anyone could hear any shots that night. What with that ruddy organ playing? Go and tell him to stop, McGregor. It's not like there's a proper service going on. Ah! You must be the gentleman from the yard. <laughs> How do you know that? Oh, it's a small town. News travels fast. I'm Reverend Bonington. Poor, poor Isabel. Well, you and Miss Fletcher must have been very close, Reverend. Isabel was a pillar. An, an absolute pillar. It's been, uh, it's been very hard to, to manage without them. And, of course, these days, her sister Violet isn't quite... Well, you'll meet her, won't you? I hear vicarages do very good cheese. Eh? Oh, well, we'll try our best. Mrs. Horsley's a pretty decent pastry cook. Uh, she rather spoils me. <laughs> Who the hell is Mrs. Horsley? The housekeeper, sir. She found the body with the reverend here. She'd been picking some mint from the garden. I'm rather partial to mint tea since my visit to the Holy Land. You'd like the chief constable. He's in a rubbish, aren't he? Ah, uh, ladies, these are the gentlemen from Scotland Yard. About ruddy tame. Ah, uh, you must be Miss Fletcher. Must I? Uh, this is Mrs. Horsley. You the housekeeper, then? Ah. Uh-huh. Tea strong, lots of sugar, and scones and cream would be nice. This isn't a cafeteria. Just as well, because I'm not paying. Lame and cheek. Come up here from London and think they can just order me around with a... <laughs> I'm Violet Slatcher, Chief Inspector. Violet, dear, you must put your feet up and rest. Rest? Rest? How can I rest when my poor sister's murderer is walking around laughing at us all? Even my darling Isabel won't be able to rest right now. Miss Slatcher, what's the difference in age between the two of you? Eh? But 16 years. Isabel was what you might call an afterthought, but a blessed one. If it had been one of their own lot, they would have bought the killer to justice fast enough. I'm sorry? I'm violent. The police are all Catholics, oh. the lot of them. And as for the chief constable... Violet, I've told you before, just because there's been some trouble between the two communities... We've been nursing a murderer in our bosom, Reverend. And what have they done? Nothing. Nothing! Are you telling me you know who the murderer is? Oh, I know, all right. My dear Violet, I've warned you before. These wild accusations. Yeah, yeah. Miss Slatcher, who is it you think murdered your sister? As the Reverend said, I have no proof. I can only put my trust in the Lord and you. Hmm. What exactly was your sister's relationship to Gerald Butt? They were engaged to be married. Mr. Butt says they were just good friends. Mr. Butt is a liar. He is also a debauched libertine, a shameless womanizer, and a man who gives his word only to break it. But I'm not saying any more. I think that might be best, Violet. Here, Jesse. I should told you about the breach of promise. The breach of promise? Thank you, Mrs. Horsley. You're welcome. Isabel loved Gerald Boat Sergeant, so you can imagine what a shock it was when this swine had told her he'd fallen for somebody else. Somebody else? I gave him a straight choice. Either he stood by his sacred obligations or we would seek the redress of the law and see how that would affect his career as an officer and a gentleman. And what did he decide to do? Well, there wasn't time for him to decide anything. I assume he was going to meet my poor sister that night and get her to change her attitude. So Gerald Butt would have got out of a very difficult situation if your sister was out of the way. Well, you are the detective, Chief Inspector. (coughs) Sorry, a little tickle. Are you going to eat all at school, Mrs. Horse? I'm going to have a good try. No, you're right. I think I'll take the rest for later. Come on, McGregor. Oh, yes, sir. Oh, just one thing, madam. Yes, Chief Inspector? Why did you tell the local newspaper your sister was on the point of recovery? What? Oh, Violet. Who told you that? Never you mind. How could you have been so heartless? Heartless? You are the ones who are heartless. I just couldn't bear it any longer. My poor Isabel lying there and everybody just forgetting about her. If my dear mother were alive to see all this... Miss Slatcher. I wanted to make them remember again. Remember the man who shot her was walking around unpunished. I wanted revenge. Yes, yes, don't get so het up. Have some more tea. Mrs. What's your name? Horseface. Horsley. As the Bible says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It also says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Ah, yes, but it also oh, says... Oh, for pity's sake, this isn't the epilogue. Miss Fletcher, you gave out this completely fictitious story about your sister's recovery just to stir the whole thing up again. Is that it? Yes. And it worked, didn't it? You were here? And he'll hang, won't he? The man who did it, I mean, when you catch him... If I have anything to do with it, madam, and I always get my man. Or someone. 
By this time, the chief inspector felt he had solved the case single-handed. The only good part was at least I wasn't having to watch him eat his supper night after night. Oh, ruddy sprouts. <clears throat> Have some more of my cheese and leek tartlets, Chief Inspector. Oh. They're Humphrey's favourites. Who's Humphrey, a cat? I'm Humphrey. Hmm? So, how's the investigation coming along? Good as done, Chief Constable. It's the fiancé. You see, the young woman, the dead one, was going to sue him for breach of promise. Two bullets in the head at close range sorted that out. And he was in the hospital on Tuesday, in her room, at the very time of the murder. Got it in one. I'll finish him off tomorrow. And just one thing that niggles me, though. Know. What's that? Dunno. It's lurking at the back of my enormous brain, probably lodged between a courgette and a swede. Do you know, Chief Inspector, I write poetry, yeah. and I find my best ideas come when I'm not thinking about them. Maybe if our Lillian recited a poem, it'd help you to relax, Lillian. Sea oh. Fever by John Maysfield. I must go down to the sea again, the lonely sea in the sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. I can feel my homicidal brain working off, already. And the white sail shaking, and a grey mist. Well, aren't we going to the air base again? Mr. Bot says he'll only see you if it's here on his dad's farm, where he can have easy access to the hedge and beyond. <sighs> Reckon he was lying about being just good friends with Isabel? I don't know, sir. He's quite a dashing young man. And apparently the late Miss Slatcher, um, wasn't. Beauty is more than skin deep, you know. How is Mrs. Dover? The same. You can talk to my Gerald here. But you will leave your hands off his throat. Yes, yes, keep your hair on. What's left of it? Hello, Gerald. Decided to change your story? Why should I change the truth, Chief Inspector? Why should I change the truth, Chief Inspector? Because I know you were at the hospital on Tuesday morning. Of course you know, it's no secret. But what is a secret, Mr. Butt, is that Isabel Slatcher didn't die of her gunshot wounds. She was smothered with her own pillow. What? What? But, no buts. Ah. See what I did there, sir? Yes, sir. And I know why you smothered her, laddie. You thought she was going to wake up and point the finger at you. But well, why on earth would our Gerald want to shoot poor Isabel in the first place? And apparently the Slatchers were about to sue him for breach of promise of marriage. <laughs> Is that what the mad sister's been telling you? I can't reveal my sources, but yes, it was the mad sister. Chief Inspector, Isabel and I were good friends, but there wasn't ever really anything between us. Have you got someone else? Well... Yes, actually. But I always thought Isabel had someone, too. Someone she would never talk about. What made you think that? I don't know. Just a slight glint in her eye. I think maybe she was going to tell me that awful night. Listen, laddie, are you going to tell me that this breach of promise stuff was just a figment of the older sister's imagination? That's exactly what he's telling you. Yeah. Then why the hell did you bother visiting her the very day she snuffed it? Huh? Got him there, my brother. I didn't. Eh? You were in the hospital. Everybody saw you. I went to the hospital because Violet asked me to, but I never went into Isabel's room. Then what the hell did you do? I had a cup of coffee with Nurse Horncastle. She's an old school friend. I thought I'd rather sit and talk to her than a girl in a coma. Aye, well, anyone would, son. Unless you're a pervert. But then Nurse Pearson popped in to check on Miss Slatcher and found her dead. I didn't want to mention the copy because I didn't want to get Jill, uh, uh, Nurse Horncastle, into any trouble. Ring her up, she'll vouch for me. McGregor, see to it. Ah, this is very inconvenient. What, you can't just string up me son for murder? Got it in one. So without his usual prejudices to fall back on... Chief Inspector Dover found himself in the rare position of having to do some detective work. But first, we had an invitation to Sunday lunch. Don't you like a courgette and turnip pie, Sergeant? But I'm afraid I'm not a great vegetable man, Mrs. Muckle. Unlike your boss. Look at him tucking in. Huh. Aye, am I? Oh, dear God. So I am. You must have worn me down, Mrs. M. Oh, that's the spirit. So, have you arrested our man yet? He didn't do it. What? 
Oh, dear. Oh, that's a pity, huh? Eh? A bloody tragedy. So now we've got to find the cold-blooded maniac who did shoot this wretched woman eight months ago and then came back to finish the job. And we don't even have a murder weapon, thanks to your lot's incompetence. Yeah, steady on. Do you know anyone who might have had a German Luger, sir? Well, the Germans all had them. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, actually, the Kersley Pie Gang had one. Always boasting about it, they were. Who the hell's the Kersley Pie Gang? Bunch of Catholic lads. Nice boys, but a bit wild. Very wild. Well, eh, uh, hooligans, actually. Juvenile delinquents. It's all that meat. Why didn't you tell us about the Kersley Pie Gang? He didn't ask. Uh, and they couldn't have done it anyway. Why not, sir? Because they were in jail, silly. The night of the shooting. In jail? What for? Digging up a Protestant grave. Ah, you know what lads are like. They said one of the Protestant boys came on a bit strong with some of their lasses. <laughs> it's like a running feud. Like a running sore. Not unlike this pie. Hey, but enough of this grisly murder talk. Lillian? Oh, here it comes. Give us one of your poems, Pat. Ah, you'll enjoy this, Sergeant. Oh, I'm sure I shall. I love poetry. In winter, I get up at night and dress by yellow candlelight. In summer, quite the other way. Come on, McGregor, we've got work oh, to do. Yeah. I was enjoying that. Uh, what exactly are we doing? You're going to Isabel Slatcher's house. Search it for clues, top to bottom. And where are you going, sir? Have a word or two with this Kersley Pie Gang. Where do they hang out? Las Torres Coffee Bar. It's run by Pedro. Kersley's only Spaniard. Can't miss it. It's right opposite the Protestant church. But you haven't finished your Sunday lunch. Uh, lucky escape. Oh. I was almost getting converted. Oh. You won't find what you're looking for in there, Sergeant. Those are Isabel's private things. No. I'm really sorry, Miss Slatcher, but I have to do this. Anyway, how do you know what I'm looking for? I don't. But Isabel's life was like an open book. I'm sure it was. But everyone has some secrets. Little things they'd rather nobody else knew about. Not even their big sister. In this house, we opened our hearts and our lives to God. He sits in every corner. He abides in every... Where did you get that underwear? Well, I just found it. At the back here, rather nice, isn't it? Really. It's disgusting. You put it there, didn't you? No, I did not. I've never planted anything in my life. Now, Chief Inspector Dover. Uh, uh, no, you're entirely wrong. Then poor Isabel must have bought them by mistake. Uh, well, I'll have to keep on looking, I'm afraid. That Butman could have bought them for her. Perhaps he had an argument. I don't know. She, she wouldn't wear them, so... Miss Slatcher, Gerald Butt didn't touch your sister. He didn't shoot anyone. He's completely in the clear. What? He had an alibi, and it checked out. I don't believe it. I'm afraid it's true. Then who on earth? Who else was at the hospital on Tuesday? I mean, who knew Isabel? At the hospital? Well, why is that relevant? Uh, please, bear with me. Well, it's the only hospital in town. Lots of people come to visit. But I think we're getting well, away from... I suppose from... any of them could have been at the church that night in March, then run off. I really don't see the connection, Sergeant. What are you doing now? I'm looking at Isabel's Bibles. She had a lot, didn't she? Put those down. Miss Slatcher. Those are the Lord's words, his holy books. What makes you possibly Well, if think... you were going to hide something... I'm afraid I shall have to complain to your superiors. That's your prerogative, of course. Yeah, hang on. What's that? What? There. Peeking out from behind that big book. Eh? Well, I've no idea. I'll get it, Sergeant. It looks like a letter. But if Isabel hid it in the Bible, it must be a secret. We'll have to respect her secrets. I'm afraid the dead have no secrets, Miss Slatcher. Miss Slatcher, the letter, please. Thank you. That looks like a rough draft of some sort. Can't quite read a writing with all this crossing out. Give it here. Dear Vic. Dearest Vic, darling Vic. I can't keep this a secret any longer. What's she talking about? I've absolutely no idea. I know you feel the same way I do. If only she didn't stand in our way. Well, that's it. There's no more. And it's definitely her writing. Well, yes, of course it is. But it makes no sense. Well, who's Vic? Well, I was hoping you'd tell me. Well, you were right in one sense. Your late sister's life is now an open book.
Ah, good evening, sir. Yeah. Lovely weather for fish. Yeah. Uh, well, what can I get you? Sir? A nice strong tea, an Eccles cake, and a bun on the ass. Oh, you well, I don't know about yes, that. Yes, you do. Now, I'm looking for some lads. Call themselves the Curdsley Pie Gang. Aye, aye. Anyone here been frying big? And I think I smell pig. <laughs> Ow. Hey, please, no, sir. Ow, Ow, that's my hair you're pulling. Decent of you to stand up, young man, but please do sit down. Ah. Oh, oh, sorry. Did my clumsy knee get in the way of your downward trajectory? Oh, that was uncalled for. What's your name? Freddy Gash. And I'm the leader of the Pie Gang. Oh, I'm so impressed. I hear tell... You got a German Luger, Freddy. Well, you hear wrong. Oh dear, my knee's twitching again. Must be my St. Vitus dance. No. Okay, I, I had a Luger. I got it from a guy in Soho on a church trip to Westminster Cathedral. Cost us 20 quid, but I don't have it now. Where'd you give it to? I didn't give it to no one. I lost it. Now, why don't I believe you? Oh, put your knee down, please. Oh, can, can we talk outside? Can't hear you. Speak up. It's a bit embarrassing. Can we talk outside? It's raining. Please. I'll be back for my tea and cake. Hey, we'll call the minutes. <laughs> Madre mia. Struth! I hate the North. All right, Marlon Brando, what's so embarrassing? Well, this must have been around February. Yeah. Me and the lads were a bit angry, like, because of what the Prots had done to our lassies. Sweet maidens, one and all. Well, exactly. So we wanted to get our own back. We were Luger. I was just going to fire it into the air, just to give them the willies life. Who exactly were you intending to frighten? I keep telling you, the Protestant lads. Only they weren't where we thought they were. We got the day wrong, but by that time, we were too fired up. So who did you scare? The mother's meeting. The mother's meeting? Yeah. Dear Lord, so what happened, Mr. Big? Well, I came in with the lads waving the gun. But before I could even fire a warning shot, they came at me. It was horrible. Who came at you? The mothers. They were like a bunch of, I don't know, witches. They were smacking us and hitting us with the handbags. You should investigate, Chief Inspector. They're a danger to the public. Oh, put out an alert. Maybe call Interpol. What happened to the gun? It fell out my hand. I haven't seen it since. Here, you don't think one of them mothers shot that sleeping beauty woman? <laughs> I wouldn't put it past them. Why the hell would you think that? Well, I mean, it was at that church. What was at the church? The meeting where I lost the gun. It was over there at the Protestant church hall. Is that a nut roast you're eating, sir? In a pub? What of it? Nothing, I I've simply discovered there's the one type of food doesn't put me to sleep, OK? The sooner I can solve the ruddy case, the sooner I can get out of this northern hellhole and back to the smoke. And Mrs. Dover. I oh, had to spoil it, didn't you? I'm sorry. So how are you getting on? Let's just say, I'm pretty sure I found out a lot more than you. Why does it have to be a competition? But otherwise, we wouldn't know who's best, would we? You never quite grasped the concept of teamwork, have you, sir? Anyway, for this time, I reckon I'm the one who's come up, Trumps. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh, come on then, Mr. Smug. Isabel Slatcher had a secret lover. What? While she was... Not while she was in a coma. Before. Here. Looks not a letter. Or the first draft of one. It's definitely her handwriting. Dearest Vic. Who's Vic? No idea. But whoever he is, does a wife, isn't there? See? The letter talks about her. I bet you didn't find anything to match that. <laughs> in fact, I bet you a hundred pounds. Oh, I found the gun. Oh. Have you? Well, where is it? No, not a clue. When I say found it, I know where it was last. In the church hall, a uh, mother's meeting, some young thug was waving it around and he lost it when the mothers duffed him up. So it could be any one of the mothers who picked it up. Exactly. We find a one with an husband called Vic and Bob's your uncle. <laughs> or Vic's your husband. <laughs> Uh, hang on, sir. I've just had a thought. Spare me. Sir, before we talk to the mothers, there is just one other person we haven't spoken to. Who? The organist. The organist? Have you forgotten, laddie? He was playing all the time the shots were fired. He must not be one hell of a marksman, or else he played a very long, sustaining note. Ah. Mm, it's all right. I just have this feeling I'm missing something. That's for sure. OK. So what's his name? No idea. I'll ring the chief constable. No need. I heard the organ playing just before when I was outside the coffee bar. It's right opposite the church. If you hurry, you can be there in five minutes. And what about you? I haven't finished my nut roast. Oh, sir. What am I saying? Those words must never get back to the yard. <laughs> A lovely sound. 
Thank you. Must be all those nuts. Ah, the organ. <laughs> you can't beat a bit of bark. Ah! Oh! <laughs> you gave me a turn, and it's Sanson. I don't care, it's Ruddy Van Gogh. What's your name? Uh, Edward Davenport. Oh, what a shame. Sorry, Pat. What's your full name? Well, my full name? Well, it's a bit of a mouthful. Spit it out. <clears throat> Edward Elgar, Vaughan Williams, Johann Sebastian Victor Davenport. Victor? That's the one that surprised you. <laughs> Actually, it was my dear mother's maiden name. The Victors are a big family round here. Apparently her dad insisted. <laughs> uh -huh. So where were you the night Isabel Slatcher was shot, Victor? Oh, <laughs> are you the gents from the yard. Well, I already told the police back in March. I was here, practising <laughs> the whole evening, tout la soirée. <laughs> Everyone heard me. He's right. Come on, McGregor. Yeah, it's okay, sir. Oh, God. What are you doing now, Eddie? Oh, sorry, I just tripped on a loose wire. Hang on. Mr. Davenport, what exactly is this? What's it look like? It's a little microphone. A microphone? So the wire goes behind this curtain. Oh, I see. It's attached to a tape recorder. What do you need a microphone for, Mr. Davenport? And a tape recorder. So I can record myself in action. Make sure I'm playing as well as I'd like to. I have very high standards. Aha! What do you mean, aha? Uh -huh. I'll tell you outside, sir. Oh, goody. Are you married, Mr. Davenport? The right person hasn't come along, Sergeant if you get my drift. But give me the right key and I'll play in any flat. <laughs> eh? No, it's just me and my organ for the moment. Come on, McGregor. Uh, if you need to talk to me again, gents, especially you, Sergeant, I'm usually around. Yes, OK. Thank you, Mr. Davenport. You can get my schedule from the vicar. Yes, yes OK. You. What? Vic. Vicar. You idiot, McGregor. Me? She was having a fling with Bonnington. Come on. I still think it could be the organist. He could have just let the tape play while he popped out and did the deed. Him? <laughs> oh, you'd have more chance of a fling with him than Isabel would. Now, what did that letter say? I can't keep it a secret any longer. Give it to me. Yeah. We must do something about her. Who the hell is her? No idea. I suppose it could be Mr. Bonington's wife. What wife? Mrs. Bonington. Really sad. She's a very poorly woman. She's institutionalized. How the hell do you know that? No, Sarncastle told me. When I went to check out Gerald Bus alibi. And you didn't think to tell me? We didn't ask. Anyway, you keep things from me. You great Caledonian twit. All this time. Don't you see? Isabel must have been wanting to push things too far. Divorce or something. Word of that gets out, and the Reverend Bonington can kiss his living goodbye. Yes. So he found the gun in the church hall after the mother's meeting, and when he had the opportunity, he shot her. He must have known Biggles was coming to meet her that night. So he decided to do it when he could pin it on a poor old boyfriend. But what about the hospital last Tuesday? The smothering? Pound or a penny, old Vic was there that morning, visiting some patient or other. If he was, that's our man. There's a phone box outside the cafe. You phone the hospital, I'll go back and sit in the church. I'm catching my death in this, right? Always has to be me, doesn't it? Always. Chief Inspector. Chief Inspector. Hey, hey, hey. Have a bit of it. Hang on. Power of good music, eh? Well, I managed to catch that nice nurse Horncastle again. She was only too pleased to help. After a naughty coffee with our Mr. Butt. <laughs> Indeed. She said she did see the vicar at the hospital that morning. He was visiting an old lady who'd been bitten by a rabbit. By a... doesn't matter. Right, well, that's it. We got our man. Do they hang vicars, do you think? We still don't have any actual proof, sir. It's all supposition. Uh, you and your fancy university notions. Well, come on. <clears throat> No time like the present. That's what I always say. Unless it's lunchtime. Unless it's lunchtime. What if he still has the gun, sir? Then he'd get off with insanity. Who holds on to a murder weapon? Oh, 
Oh, it's you. There's no more scones. Uh, sorry to disturb you, Mrs. Horsley. Is the vicar in? Of course he's in. It's his house. Not for much longer. Move out of the way, woman. Sergeant. Uh. Hey, wait your feet. I've just scrubbed. Chief Inspector, <laughs> do come in. Uh, that'll be all, Mrs. Horsley. Thank you. I was just going to call you. Were you indeed? About a confession? Oh, that's the other lot. No, I've managed to expedite poor Isabel's funeral at her sister's request. We're having it tomorrow morning at the cemetery on the hill. Well, I'm afraid, Vicar, that it might turn out to be your funeral if you get my drift. I'm afraid I don't, actually. Sergeant. Reverend Bonington, I'm arresting you for the cold-blooded murder of Isabel Slatcher. What? Don't try to deny it. You were on the scene last March. You were at the hospital on Tuesday. The hospital? What's that got to do she with... She was in that? love with you, wasn't she? You're an ambitious man, Reverend, with a wife in an institution. This affair wouldn't exactly look good in your resume. Now listen here, Chief Inspector. We found a letter, sir. A letter she either sent or was about to send you. There's a letter? Oh, dear. Well, I, I suppose there's no point in denying it, then. I'm not a man who lies, Chief Inspector. Yes. Isabel and I did have a, a friendship. I knew it. I ruddy knew it. Yes, sir. In your own time, Reverend Bonington. I admit it, gentlemen. I did harbour thoughts and... Yes. Feelings for poor Isabel. Feelings about which I felt extremely guilty. And what with my poor, poor wife. And? And? Call that a ruddy confession? We're talking murder here, Vic. Murder? Why on earth should I murder anyone? That's enough! Mrs. Horsley. What are you doing? Madam, would you please put that gun down? It's the little gun. I don't think that's the most pertinent point right this minute, Sergeant. Mm. Oh, how would you just know, Reverend? What you said about that slatcher woman? What, that I had feelings for her? Yes, yes, I admit it. What's it to you, Mrs. Horsley? Maybe this will help you understand. Ah! Ah! After her, McGregor. But what about the vicar? Get the mad woman before she shoots someone else. Sir! Relay! Your lucky is not your head. Ah. She's obviously more accurate from closer up. Ah, she'll be in the church. She goes there when she's upset. Call an ambulance. Hey? I'm off to arrest my murderer. McGregor. Yes, sir. What are you doing on your knees, McGregor, praying? I think she's near the front of the church. And she might still have some bullets. Women. Out. Why do they make churches so dark? Ah. Mrs. Horsley, come out, please, madam. Or it'll only go worse for you. How can it go worse for us? I had hopes of being the next Mrs. Reverend Bonneton. Then that inner loper came along. But she means Miss Latcher, sir. I know who she means. So, you were in love with Reverend Bonnington. What do you mean, Wolf? I still am. But if I can't have him, and truth be told, it looks pretty unlikely right now, then nobody else can either. Is he dead? No, madam. You're clearly better at close range. Or maybe you just stick to smothering. You're very good at that. What do you mean, smothering? What do you think I mean? I've no idea. Don't give me that. I really don't know what you're blethering about. You thought Isabel Slatcher was going to wake up and spill the beans, so you went to the hospital on Tuesday and finished the job. Tuesday? I was at my sister's in Dalton on Tuesday. It's me deal. What? Oh, for pity's sake. So if you didn't smother her, who did? How the hell should I know? I'm not a detective. I'm a demented killer. Well, not a killer, as it turns out. You're still demented. Got any bullets left? That's for me to know and you to find out. <laughs> Mrs. Horsley, please! Reverend, get down! This time, I'm not going to miss you, lofty. Quick, McGregor, while she's distracted. Oh, always me, isn't it? <laughs> Got her, sir! <laughs> get off it! Right, well, I suppose I'd better go and tell the Chief Constable. Oh, that'll be the ambulance. This ruddy case is getting more baffling by the minute. Hmm. Wonderful Spanish omelette there, now. Oh, you've done it again. Thank you, Humphrey. So, let me get this straight over. Mrs. Horsley shot Isabel Slatcher, but it wasn't her who smothered the girl. Apparently not, sir. 
We've been looking for one person when in fact there were two totally separate attackers. But why on earth would someone else want the poor woman dead? It doesn't make sense. Ah, no, it beats me. Perhaps our Lillian can help. Oh. The owl and the pussycat. The owl and the pussycat went to sea in a beautiful pea green boat. They took some honey and plenty of money wrapped up in a five pound net. Oh, Lord, can't we? Just once. Oh, let us be married. Too long we have tarried. But what shall we do for a ring? You got any children, Chief Inspector? No, and I'm thanking God for it every minute. They sailed away for a year and a day to the land where the bong tree grows. And there, in a word... Oh, that's, that's lovely. Uh, really cheery. But uh, maybe you'd better stop. No, hang on. You, annoying girl. <gasps> Say that again. And there, in a word... Not that, you fool. The earlier bit. Uh, they sailed away for a year oh. and a day to the land where... Enough! That's it. That's what, Chief Inspector? Never you mind. But I'll be needing my oats in the morning, Mrs Muckle. I'm going to a funeral. Oh, Londoners. And we commit her body to the ground. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes... Dust to dust. But bleak here, isn't it, sir? The old oh, ravaged town's, town's bleak. I wish you'd tell me what your new theory is. If well, I told you, then it wouldn't be a surprise. It wouldn't be a surprise if it held water. Now, now, laddie. Okay. Coffins in the ground. No time like the present. Okay. Violet Fletcher. You know it is. Can't you leave me to my grief? Sorry, madam. But we may have to add to it. Can we move away from the grave just a bit? All right, Chief Inspector, what do you want? Have you caught my sister's killer yet? I believe so, madam. Violet Slatcher, I've come to arrest you for the murder of Isabel Slatcher. What? You must be mad, Chief Inspector. Shh, laddie, Miss Slatcher, I'm not underestimating your love for your late sister. In fact, you loved her so much, you couldn't bear it looking like the person who shot her wouldn't hang for it didn't look as though they were even going to catch him. Well, that's as may be. But you knew that if your sister survived for just a year and a day, as the poem goes, whoever shot her couldn't be convicted of murder. So you made sure she died well before the midnight hour by smothering her with her own pillar. No. That's why you lured Gerald Butt into the hospital. So if the smothering was discovered, as it obviously would be... There'd only be one person to blame. The person who was at the scene both times and who, in your eyes, had motive galore. Only it wasn't him. No? I couldn't bear it. That the person who shot my beloved sister wouldn't pay the ultimate penalty. The Lord would have wanted it to happen. You know that, don't you? And the Lord helps those who help themselves. Exactly. I think you'd better come with us, madam. I I'm sorry. Just wait a second, really. Sir? That isn't the whole story, is it, Miss Slatcher? What do you mean? I think you know what I mean. Sir, I don't know what you mean. Isabel wasn't your sister, was she, Miss Slatcher? What? No, no, don't say that. No, no, keep away from oh, me. Where's she going? The way out's in the other direction. There's nowhere to... Oh, my God. Oh! She just wants to be with her daughter. Her daughter? <laughs> Miss Slatcher... Please, let me help you out. I think the men need to fill in the grave. I want to be with my Isabel. I understand. But here, please, take my hands. That's it. There. Are you all right? I'll never be all right, Sergeant. But you might as well ask the questions. How did you keep it a secret, Miss Slatcher? When I got pregnant... I was just 15. I know, not exactly the spinsterish religious nutcase you thought, eh, Sergeant? My mother simply pretended she was having another child. And when I began to show, we both went to my aunt's in Bambra. And when we came back with Isabel, my mother told everyone she was hers. I've kept up the pretense ever since. Even Isabel didn't know. The Lord understands. Oh, we all understand, Miss Slatcher. Now, hey, perhaps it's time we let your daughter rest in peace. 
Mmm. Scotch eggs. Wonderful. Pork pies. Just a job. Now, this is poetry, my brother. Positively epic. Looks like the collected works. One thing I don't understand, sir. How did you know Violet Slatcher wasn't Isabel's sister? Been niggling me for days. Something she said when we first met her at the vicarage. If my dear mother was alive to see this, my dear mother. Surely at that time she'd say our dear mother, or even Isabel's dear mother, but it didn't really click until the funeral. She just sounded like a mother talking about a child. Hmm. Or do you think we might have got here quicker if you'd kept me in the picture and didn't persist in strangling innocent people? Maybe. But a man's got to have some perks in his job, doesn't he? Do you know, I fancy a lettuce leaf now. Stand the crowds. And that is why I want this transfer to go through. Chief Inspector Dover may occasionally be right when it comes to finding the felon. But he's just so awful with it. In Dover and the Sleeping Beauty, Chief Inspector Dover was played by Kenneth Cranham, Sergeant McGregor, Stuart Macquarie, Chief Constable Muckle, Philip Whitchurch, Mrs. Muckle, Colleen Prendergast, Reverend Bonington, Sean Prendergast, Mrs. Horsley, Geraldine McNulty, Violet, Debbie Arnold, Freddie Gash, Ross Adams, and Lillian Muckle by Cheska Bonetti. Dover and the Sleeping Beauty was dramatized for radio by Paul Mendelssohn from a novel by Joyce Porter. It was directed by David Ian Neville.